a wonderful book that he wrote along with Jitendra Bajaj called Annam Bahu Kuruvatam. Still remember that book. And I was reading. I was reading Fukuoka, One Straw Revolution. I was reading those things at that time. And this book was a real eye-opener, you see. And of course, we were also reading Dharampal. We were reading Bharatiya Manas and Chetana. We were reading about 18th century Indian science. Then I read Claude Al Alvarez, Ashish Nandi, all of that. And then we did a project ourselves. First, we started at IIT. Then in January, I carried it on. On uh, the project was called Indian Science and Spirituality, you know, and uh, or sometimes it got a different name, Science and Spirituality in India. But you know, we've produced four different oh, books. One was what well, the latest one. Um, I could show you. Um, um, so the point is that this is a form. This is the first we did. Indian perspectives on science and civilization. I'll just hand it over to Professor Shrinivas. There is an echo, echo coming. He is in two places. Who is in two places? In two places. Okay. And the echo is coming because of that. Uh, Dr. Shrinivas, ah, you, yes. you have to log out from one. We don't like... Uh, we, we like some Advaita here, so one is enough. <laughs> oh, 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 fine, fine. No, so great. No. Wonderful. Uh, and we can mute our mics also. But we still see you in two places. One shows that one has uh, low bandwidth and the other one shows you as uh, as you are, I suppose. Uh, but uh, I, I, I just wanted to say, just by preliminary remarks, our understanding of science is, uh, has uh, increased over the years. And there have been, even in the West, critiques of science, not just Karl Popper, but Farabend, uh, again, a Paul Farabend, J. Paul Farabend, <laughs> and uh, Against Method, it's a famous book. But the whole idea is that science is not what it's seen. It is also culture bound, it all has its ideology, and it is certainly not uh, trans-historical, that is, the two topos of Greek thought, time and space, you know, it's not something that has transcends them. So there is culture, there is religion, uh, there is uh, civilization, there are goals, there are protocols, and let's not forget there is funding, <laughs> there is peer review, there is the politics of journals. So science is also conditioned by all this. And we see this, we're in the middle of this, with this lab leak and other competing theories. We see how Lancet, such a famous journal, has been infiltrated. You know, how they disallowed certain questions. So we are living through this and we are living through how big pharma or big business or big uh, how all of these impact a science uh, not only do they impact science in terms of what is worth studying where is the funding going but also how it is done how it is presented and uh, i can't think of anybody better than uh, Dr. M.D. Srinivas to lead us through this session. We are very proud of you, of your work at the Madras Institute. And uh, you've been uh, working steadily. So many volumes have come out. The new ones are on census. These are eye-opening volumes. I wish people took some time and read about the demographic changes that are happening in our country and uh, how we are uh, not aware we live in a fool's paradise so uh, you know some friends and i were talking and uh, the paradox of our times and i'll end with this the paradox of our times is that hindu civilization has never been safer more prosperous more capable of change and modification for 1000 years for the last 1000 years but Never have the challenges that are facing it been so well-defined, so sharply etched, and so threatening. 
to the very, uh, should I say, DNA of who we are. And those who are looking the other way are only ostriches burying their head in the sand because we have the civilization has something which the world needs. We are a part of world civilization. It's not that I'm not talking about Hindu exceptionalism. The Sanatan Parampara is a part of world civilization. The loss of this Parampara will be a great loss to humanity. So with these words, I, uh, I hand it over to uh, Dr. M.D. Srinivas. I'll invite uh, Professor Rajvi Sharmaji to come in at the end. Uh, but because it's a session on science, uh, unless you want to speak in the beginning, sir, you're most welcome. Uh, please, if you have some observations, you're most welcome. And then we can give it to uh, Dr. M.D. Srinivas. Sir, aap unmute kijiye. I'm saying. Sir, unmute. Sir, unmute kijiye, sir. I'm saying uh, I just want to welcome the uh, learned speakers as well as the chair of the session. And I think we add uh, to what you have already stated. I am not a person of science. Thank you. Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Srinivas. Okay. okay, Namaskar. It's a great pleasure to be associated with the Swaraj Vaicharik Swaraj Abhiyan of India Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, with which I was associated more than 15 years ago for quite some time. And it's a great pleasure to share a session of uh, Professor Chandrakant Raju with whom my acquaintance goes back to nearly 30 years, when we met in Hindu during a Schrodinger Centenary Conference. Uh, and uh, Professor Kanmalkar, who's also a very uh, distinguished uh, old acquaintance with whom I've had uh, discussions from 1980s onwards. Professor Raju, as you all know, has been a very distinguished uh, historian of science, but he's one of those Rare historians of uh, science has emphasized that uh, the history of science has to go with philosophy of science. That unless we are able to establish the epistemological uh, foundations of Indian science, merely recounting few achievements here and there uh, will not lead us back to uh, Swaraj in science. So he's going to speak on uh, decolonizing uh, mathematics and uh, science. I have only a small crib about the title. Uh, I think uh, Swaraj is a very high word. Mahatma Gandhi said it's a Vedic word. It stands for self-rule and self-restraint. Raju might have had objection to him, Swaraj, the word him, which was uh, not uh, Indian, which of course is a modification of Hindu. But uh, decolonization, I think, is a euphemism, because colonization is a euphemism for uh, conquest, destruction, even cultural genocide by the West. And they never really colonized India in the sense of settling in India, except for a large army after 1857. So uh, I would uh, humbly request, he has several articles on decolonization. Perhaps he should switch to this Farad that uh, uh, IAS has come through. And I would not like to take more time. I would want the audience to listen to Professor Raju's views on uh, decolonization of uh, mathematics and science. Professor Raju. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, indeed a very great pleasure to have you here and to, uh, I mean, uh, you are one person with whom I have so much in common, whether it is quantum mechanics or epistemology of mathematics or history of science or the Yukti Bhasha. So I am very happy that you are here. And at least, uh, you know, I have one person who will understand most of what I'm saying, if not all, without any problem. Okay, so I will come to your point about uh, Swaraj, because I wrote about Swaraj in thought in 2012. I will just show you that paper. So let me start my presentation. I have a formal pre presentation and uh, I want, uh, what do I want? Where is my presentation gone? Uh, Where is it? Uh, Microsoft text input settings, Windows, Firefox. 
Okay, so I have to wait a minute. I have to put my Firefox in the proper mode. Okay, now it should come. Uh, share, share. Firefox, that's right. Are you seeing the screen? Are you able to see it? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah? Okay, right. So let me start with that. Uh, before I go to decolonization and Swaraj, I want to look at language. Because there's been a lot of talk about language and everybody says that first of all, if you want to talk about uh, decolonization, you should talk in Hindi. I explained my problem several times. That uh, Hindi mein jo hai, mathematics ka galat anwad hota hai. And this is a paper I have written for, uh, because uh, Professor Hada asked me, which is Ganit Banam Mathematics. It should be appearing in this. So, uh, I can't really talk about it because the word mathematics has been wrongly translated as Hindi, in Hindi as Ganit. And that thing has become uh, very prachalit. Okay. So uh, let me go back to that because if we at least if we are talking so much about language in 75 years, we should at least make a correct translation and likewise for angle and so on. So it is difficult to talk in Hindi in half an hour. I'll have to explain so many terms and so on. So I'll talk in English. Uh, the full abstract, by the way, is posted here. I don't think it was given there. Uh, it is, this is the uh, link. You can take a look at that. Uh, all right, uh, this is a little problem that it occupies the entire screen. Let me go back to my Firefox, where was I? Okay, let's stop sharing this. All right, where was I? Why does this get lost? Abstract, okay, here we are. I'm sorry. Uh, the issue that you raised just now about um, I wrote this paper in Vardha in 2012 where I talked about Swaraj in thought. And I translated decolonization as uh, Swaraj. And I said that it is, I uh, cited the paper by, I cited uh, uh, Gandhi's work on Hind Swaraj and I cited this paper on, uh, by K.C. Bhattacharya. It is the first footnote. So I cited both of these. And uh, of course it was reprinted in, by Barlinge in Pune University Journal. But I said that you should not speak about ideas. The idea has a platonic connotation, which is very dangerous in the case of mathematics. And so I said, let's use the word uh, 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 thought because vichar has a proper translation. All right. So it has to be translated as thought. And that is what I said there. So this was way back in 2012. So when I speak of decolonization, I speak on the understanding that this is done. Then there was this uh, abstract in Palestine, which I had supposed to be giving in the Palestine Technical University, decolonizing mathematics and uh, how it enables students to do better. And there's a longish, I mean, it was supposed to be two talks, but uh, Israel uh, censored it. And so I was not uh, given a visa because I was saying some things against Einstein. So uh, I, it's a big thing. So I basically want to say I can't uh, talk about it uh, uh, so quickly. So I will just speak on a few points. So one of the things that uh, I had po uh, pointed out is that deduction is highly fallible. Now this was in a paper on decolonizing mathematics in Durban. It was a keynote and it's available online. And the other point, important point is that axiomatic proofs are not found in YouTube. It's just a myth that there are axiomatic proofs in Euclid. And I've even written a blog on it. I won't uh, go to it. But they were part of the crusading church's uh, uh, 
theology of reason and uh, this is the uh, the problem so this was actually covered also in my uh, last uh, talk at iias yes my last seminar and uh, there's a video of that but the point is that it involves a metaphysics of infinity which is tried to judge dogmas of eternity there's an article on that on eternity and infinity this is uh, in the american philosophical association and this is also posted online so uh, there are these there is this relationship and that relationship between mathematics and dogma is used by stephen hawking to push religious dogmas into science so i have written about that also written this popular article uh, it takes a lot of time yeah the christian propaganda and stephen hawking's work so uh, this is the this thing uh, the uh, problem is that this was all right with stephen hawking but roger penrose singularity theory got the nobel prize last year and this is very dangerous because this is once it gets the nobel prize so far as the indians are concerned that is the ultimate uh, proof of truth so uh, this is the whole point that i am trying to point out that there is a issue with the mathematics involved but uh, uh, this is elaborated in some recent talks i gave a talk uh, essay on euclid by uh, talk on euclid must fall uh, in tubingen and Pretoria, and uh, there's a whole uh, article that I'm writing on how Euclid was the basis of racism and so on. And there's also a, a, a conference in Bangalore, which was on 5-6 June, which is a very two very long videos, about five and a half hours. But you can see the presentations, and uh, so all this background is there. And uh, ah. this suddenly comes up with uh, more options and controls and then i cannot uh, go back to where i was this is terrible somewhere uh, it's the problem with webex okay now if i want to switch this off okay i think i shouldn't go to all these links so i want to speak of only a few points the first point i want to speak about is about proof in indian mathematics and the uh, proof in indian mathematics we see our uh, ninth standard text it says that while mathematics was central to many ancient civilizations there is no clear evidence that they used proofs this is in our current ninth standard text page 287 But there were Indian methods of proof, and there was systematic theory of proof, which was used everywhere, not only in mathematics. There is no separate concept of mathematical proof, therefore you don't find it in math text. But you find it in the end. This was there long before Aristotle. Any kind of Aristotle, Aristotle of Toledo from the 12th century, or uh, the historical Aristotle of Stagira, and these notions of proof are well documented. For example, in the Nyaya. So I'll just show you this part. we know this very well so these are the four means of proof satyaksha anuman upman and shab all right and i want to show you next that uh, these are of course they are not found in math text because they are not specific to math and they apply the same to i mean you don't have mathematical truth versus physical truth versus religious truth so many categories of truth you have one category of truth and so the same standard applies everywhere now here are the examples of its use in mathematics So, Kathiak Shiv, you see in Ganit thirteen, Arya Bhatia, you have uh, verticality from a plumb line, and uh, you have uh, you are measuring the level of the ground by means of water, which is what a mason does today. And oh, I am still on that. Okay, so then you have, for example, the Indian proof of the Pythagorean theorem at the beginning of the Yukti Bhasha, which is like this: that you draw. Uh, these two rectangles, they place them one over the other, and then cut like this and rotate, and you see that the two areas are the same. So uh, this is there, and then inference. 
So Anuman is there in goal six that the earth is a sphere. Now this is not uh, done by Pratyaksh. You don't go out into space and say, and I saw the earth to be a sphere. But you say, because as Lalla says that uh, far off trees cannot be seen. And if they cannot be seen, then uh, this is obviously because uh, uh, the earth is uh, round and you, it uh, stops your sight. All right. And then, of course, there is Ukman in the famous analogy in Gold Saran that the earth is like a kalam, kalam flower. And there is Shabd. Shabd is not usually used, but you find it in the Manap 10.10, uh, 10, Tad Vido Vidu. Because the person who is writing, he is not uh, saying that I know this. He just saying so this is what others say. Now, particularly, I want to point out the use of reasoning to infer that the earth is round. Far off trees cannot be seen. Horizon is circular. Therefore, the earth is round. Reasoning, it is not pratyaksha. So it's anuman. And the school text says that Indians never used any reason. It's completely false. But this is what it says. And uh, there were disagreements about the notion of proof. The Buddhists accepted only Pratyaksha and Anuman, and the Lokayat ex accepted only the Pratyaksha. I'll come to the Lokayat uh, argument. The only point I'm making is it does not depend on the exact day assigned to the Naya Sutra. All right, because there was a disagreement even at the time of the Buddhists and so on, and in fact, much before that. And therefore, these notions of proof, they go back a long way. Not just that I date the Nyaya Sutra to this date and that date, and therefore the proof commences from there, because there is disagreement, the Buddhist talk of Lokayat, and so on. Now, important point is, why did the Chavak reject Anuman? And uh, obviously, their argument was that it does not lead to valid knowledge. So you have the classic example of the wolf's uh, footprints, and uh, you have a man who makes those footprints on the ground from the city gate to the city center, and then uh, this leads the people of the city to the false conclusion that a wolf was around. And he is laughing at them and saying, see, they have arrived at an invalid ground. Because I made the footprint and uh, they did not know the import that a wolf was around. Now, in uh, current day philosophy and, uh, you know, logicians and philosophers, they will try to suppress the force of the Lokayat argument. They will say that, uh, you know, the argument is that deduction does not lead to valid knowledge. Inference does not lead to valid knowledge. Under certain circumstances, of course, you will see. But they try to hide it by saying it is only relative truth. You know, it is relative truth, relative to the axioms and, of course, also the logic, which I am not going to talk about. But my point is that relative truth means anything can be a relative truth. And there is a rabbit theorem. All animals have two horns. You just postulate it. A rabbit is an animal and therefore a rabbit has two horns. Absolutely absurd conclusion. And of course, it is coming from a false postulate that all animals have two horns. But how do we know it is false? You know it by pratyaksha. If you have ruled out pratyaksha, you have no means of knowing whether this is true or false. So all theorems of formal mathematics are like this. They are such relative truths. And of course, the Buddhists accepted only pratyaksha and anuman. And they rejected analogy. There's that story of the elephant and the nine blind men, blind from birth. It's in the uh, Udan Pali in the Puddak Nikai. And in contrast, of course, the Bible, which is gospel truth, says that the earth is flat. So just in case you, this I used to keep this example for my students. So you see that. The tree was so, uh, the height of the tree reached unto the heavens and the sight, therefore, to the ends of all earth. So it asserts that you can actually see tall trees from anywhere on the earth. And this is reliable testimony. It is in depth. So, uh, point I'm making is that all Indian schools of thought accepted the Pratyaksh as their science. And in fact, the first record of the experimental method is from India. I have written about it in the print uh, that it's not Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was a superstitious fellow. It is uh, from Payasi. So you can look at the uh, references here that are given to the Deja uh, But the record is there. It's also there in my book, 11 Pictures of uh, Time. So it refutes, it refutes this uh, Western lie. And he was a dishonest fellow. He was sentenced for corruption and so on. The point is, which method of proof is better? 
That's the central question. We have a certain method of proof, different systems, but everybody accepts Pratyaksh. And then there is axiomatic proof. And, yeah, this is uh, not discussed. NCRT text by saying there is no method of proof in India avoids discussing this question. And we first need to understand what is the axiomatic proof in terms of Indian concepts of proof. So the point that I'm making is that formal mathematical proof accepts only Anuman. It rejects inference, I it rejects Pratyaksh, and in a hidden way. It accepts Shabda Praman because the axioms are going to be laid down by the best, whether it's axioms of set theory or axioms of the real number system or Piano's axioms or whatever axioms you have got. They are all going to be laid down by the best. If you know of anybody non Western who laid down an axiom, please let me know. So it rejects Pratyaksh and it accepts Anuman. So this rejection of the Pratyaksh is a big problem because you see, people don't seem to understand this. I've been saying this for about 20, more than 20 years. So I'll just show you this abstract. Just the first sentence in the abstract is current formal mathematics being divorced from the empirical. The entire year, social construct and so on. It's a long paper. Please take a look. But uh, I recently realized that people don't know what the definition of an axiomatic proof is. They've never seen uh, the exact definition even though it is there in their class 9 text. They're not sure and they don't trust. So who is this guy saying something? Why should we believe him? So we will show this ignorance and trust deficit. This is how superstitions are maintained. So axiomatics proof rejects Pratyaksha. And it's also clear from the difference between 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in normal mathematics, where you will say 1 apple plus 1 apple is 2 apples, and the proof of 1 plus 1 equal to 2 by Russell, where uh, you have this kind of nonsense. 378 pages. Worse. 378 pages is all right, but I offered a prize of 10 lakh rupees in JNU for a proof of 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers. And this is the video where I offered this prize. It was there. The vice chancellor was also there. So please take a look. This is the video. It is available on YouTube. So it's about uh, how we should teach statistics for uh, social sciences and humanities, whether we should use normal mathematics or formal mathematics. Okay. And I also offered a reduced price of 1 lakh rupees if they submitted a proof of 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real number. From first principle, without assuming anything, any result of set theory. So point is that because axiomatic proof rejects the text, it is different from all Indian systems of proof. Which all of them except protection. And this is also found in the school text. Each statement in a proof has to be established only by logic. Beware of being deceived by what you see. We have such a thing, except that protection is valuable. There is a reduced sarpanyai, but uh, there is a distinction here as my term. Point I'm making is that which method of proof is better? How do we decide? We cannot do it on the uh, idea of uh, publications. So I spoke on this in 2015, and uh, it was supposed to be published in JICPR. Please excuse the typo. I was once an editor of that journal, but they you know, just appointed some illiterate referees who ensured that the paper was rejected. So it was not published. Point I'm making is there was a traditional Indian method of validating knowledge. Our method is published, 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 but secretive refereeing. Secretive refereeing, which obviously the editor can manipulate all the time. We all know that who have been scientists. So the church method of secretly evaluating something, valid knowledge, is not adequate. Because you are trying to make a major change in your Tokma Swaraj, you are asking for a major change. And I have been asking for a public debate since uh, 2015. And uh, maybe I should just mention the person who was there, the formal mathematician, was our top formal mathematician, which is, uh, let me share the name, M.S. Raghunathan. All right, was a Padma Bhushan and so on. But formal mathematicians run away from the debate. So, uh, what is the, why is the superiority a church superstition? You know, we are told, we are taught in school, we are taught in uh, mathematics that the formal method of axiomatic proof is superior. So, as I said, axiomatic proof is not found in Euclid. 
that is one of the reasons why i am arguing against euclid doesn't matter who the person is but the book does not have axiomatic proof the book is there for 750 years all the idiots in the west believed it and this was eventually admitted that there are no axiomatic proofs by dead kind by russell by hilbert at the end of the 19th century but axiomatic proofs are found in church theology crusading church theology at the same time when they are supposed to have got the euclid book and they suited the church very well why did they suit because during the crusades the church needed reasoning the uh, that was the only way it had to convert muslims and it could not convert them by force or using the bible but reason plus facts went against the church dogma why because facts go against church dogma so the church invented axiomatic reason which was a method of reasoning without facts i have an article on it maybe you can take a look at it um the church connection of reason and uh, i discuss this uh, i mean it's an expository article of course there are many others more serious articles it suited the church to give proofs based on reason because they wanted to say we are talking about reason but not facts we have reason plus facts you get science reason minus facts you get axiomatic math so they could persuade people about all sorts of imaginary things which don't exist in reality whether it is angels or god or devil or whatever uh, so beginning with assumptions instead of facts was a terrific advantage for the church to be able to talk we are reasoning about god we are reasoning about angels that is what aquinas did and we know he was a major crusading theologian who shifted the church towards the theology of reason which was adopted during the crusades and they wanted to compete with the earlier prevalent islamic aqli kalam from which it borrowed heavily using everlus and uh, was the opponent of al-ghazali and so on so aquinas theorem i'm giving you an original source primary source summa theologica how many agents can be same uh, in the same place at one time at the same time in one place so now how are you going to answer this question you see there are no facts about angels so there is nothing pratyaksha about it so you can uh, say whatever you like make any axiom you like because you want to prove something you make an axiom so as to be able to prove it and this is what aquinas uh, did so many angels can be there you can just uh, you know have them that sort of dreaming of so it is a fantasy what you get as a result so if it reads to this kind of bolder dash proof by reason then i can say like look i beware of being deceived by proofs by reason what is the reason you are talking about reason plus facts as in science or reason minus facts as in theology it needs to be specified you can't confound one with the other by just using one word reason so this kind of metaphysical reasoning starting from axioms was attributed to euclid it's not found in aristotle and so they just reinterpreted the book which was actually a book on mystery geometry nothing to do with axiomatic proof absolutely nothing it was in there and there is a counter evidence that for why it was not but we can't correct our class 9 text or even discuss it publicly what public what swaraj are we talking about class 9 text we can't discuss we can't correct we have a big big problem so right deduction is highly fallible there is no question about it more fallible than empirical proof Empirical proof is fallible. I accept. Experimental there errors are there everywhere, but it is more fallible. And why? Because you can only check a deduction. It can be an error. Anybody who has corrected a mathematics paper, you uh, students make hundreds of errors. How can it be infallible? Any kind of complex uh, proof, you know, A B C conjecture, nobody is even agreed to it, and so on. So there is a big problem. All right. Or you correct it. I do repeatedly. You know, my PhD thesis, a hundred-page calculation. I have to check it by hand. So much it took me a month. Or as in a chess game, you always make an error. Always lose to a machine. The world champion also loses. Every human being almost always makes an error. Therefore, loses to a machine. So deduction is highly fallible, more fallible. And then, of course, the question is: If you have done all that, you've got a theorem. What have you got? Is the theorem true? That's what our textbook says. Only way to be sure that something is true is to prove it, all right. And uh, therefore, it is true. If it is proved, it's a theorem. It's completely false because the truth is only the relative truth relative to the axioms. And we saw in the Bull theorem or the Rabbit theorem or Aquinas theorem that any nonsense can be relatively true. Now, this seems like a toy example. Let me give a real life example. Let's take Pythagorean theorem. 
Is Pythagorean theorem true? Of course not. All right, just because it says Pythagorean theorem 32 times in the text, you start believing it's true. It's not true in the real world. Okay, it's false on the curved surface of the earth. All right, you take a geodesic triangle, it's obviously false. And now it's not just that it is false. This is, uh, you know, that is how the geodesic is designed at the shortest distance. It's also false anywhere in the real world, anywhere in space, but the space is curved. So how are you going to get a uh, thing with straight lines and get the Pythagorean theorem? So it's a superstition that Pythagorean theorem is true. Indians did not have it. Okay, it's just superstition. Indians knew better even a thousand years earlier. Bhaskar one uh, says, you know, you are determining longitude. This is also part of the navigational problem. So you can determine it. Basically, he declares the use of the Pythagorean theorem as a course method. I won't give you the um, quotation. It is there on the link, but I think I'm uh, running a little short of time. So he says it's a method is course, as the Bhattacharya Shishya say. And he is discussing this spherical geometry is non-Euclidean long before Euclid and not long before uh, uh, non-Euclidean geometry. And this was a huge disaster for the Europeans of 200 years. Because they took the Pythagorean theorem as true and used it to determine longitude, they had no better way to do it. But the apology I hear, they say it's approximately true, but there is no concept of approximate truth in formal mathematics. So uh, see the textbook of class nine in formal mathematics, a proposition is only acceptable if it's either always true, always false. What is this 0.9% true? So you don't have those kinds of modalities in uh, formal mathematics. And if it is true, false in, false in one case, it is false. You can do only one counterexample. But you can have an approximate calculation, not a theorem. That is what we had in India. The Manas Shudra Sutra, when you have it, is you are talking about the kernel, you are talking about the diagonal, and then you are saying it's Savishesh, square root of two, with an Avshesh. And that is precisely what I do, for example, in Vajju Ganesh or in calculus at zerosum. Let me go to the last uh, topic. Uh, maybe if I have some more time, I could go on. It works superstition. Oh, it works. You may be saying, you may be criticizing, you may be something, but it works. So I've been hearing this objection from 2012. And I used to teach my students. They say that they don't know what works. They don't know one plus one equal to two. Why is it true? But they say it works. So the point is that people are ignorant and they trust the wrong things. So I had explained that uh, you say calculus works. So what, let's say calculating rocket trajectories. How are you actually going to calculate rocket trajectories? You cannot use real numbers. You teach that calculus needs real numbers, but you can never use them in practice. In practice, you can't write down a single real number like pi. And when you calculate rocket trajectories, you calculate them using a computer. And what does the computer do? It uses floating point numbers, not real numbers. Right, that is the situation. So my calculus transmission work, you know, which, uh, as you know, this big book is there. It talks of the transmission of the calculus from India to Europe in the 16th century. So this work uh, was uh, started in 1998, actually. I'll just take one minute more. I'm about to conclude just a few of this thing. And uh, the Hawaii paper was a 99, 1999 paper. And it was stolen and transmitted to Europe. I mean, that the calculus was stolen by coaching based Jesuits. And credit was given to Newton and Leibniz on what is called the doctrine of Christian discovery. So, one go into that. I want to go to the, I have an epistemic test which you know that Newton did not understand the calculus. Therefore, he could not have discovered. So, I discussed, he talked of fluxions, the complete nonsense, and nothing to do with calculus. And so on, it's abandoned. And the same thing happens in the serial prejudice, George Joseph and Dennis Almeida. Right? So uh, they have been uh, talking about this uh, for a long time. So I have a long blog on it. Please take a look. There are several blogs on it. And uh, they use the same principle that we have a right to steal. What are you going to do? They have been doing it for the last 20 years. They've been plagiarizing my work. They have been caught repeatedly. See, once they were caught in 2004 and etc. And uh, this was uh, accepted. And then again, they were caught in uh, Manchester because they did it. And then Hindustan Times published a retraction. But it came in all the 
front pages of all the uh, newspapers in India. So the point is, what exactly is happening? They failed to understand what I have said. They wrote the nonsense that Kerala, they copied, plagiarized also my Hawaii paper, that Kerala mathematicians employed floating point numbers to derive infinite series. You know, what nonsense? Floating point numbers to derive infinite series. So floating point numbers have nothing to do with Kerala mathematicians. They are uh, recent IEEE standard, 754. They are there. I have my class notes on uh, floating point uh, standards. When you do this uh, for uh, C language, this is part of that. You teach what is meant by the statement float C. But point is that uh, do we want publicity Raj or Vaicharik Swaraj? So many colonized Indians are so eager for publicity from foreigners. They say it was very good publicity and they did not support me. Now that is why I have withdrawn my course on calculus without limits. That should be calculus, I'm sorry. And let's first decide what we want, publicity or knowledge. If I have two minutes more, I can go on to laws of nature, otherwise I can stop. Can I go on for two minutes if you like? I think I think we should come back to it later because we're going behind schedule already. So do we yeah. have questions now, Professor uh, uh, Ranjipe, or uh, at the end? It's up, it's up to you, sir. You're the chair. It's up to uh, you. So what are you? We can have some ten minutes of discussion. Science I have not touched. So I'm just saying that when we talk of laws of motion, then Aquinas also had a statement that God rules the world with laws of motion, with laws of nature. And Newton believed that. He believed that he had this kind of, uh, you know, uh, he, he was uh, chosen. And therefore, he cancelled hypothesis in his own notes and wrote let. And... Uh, if you see there is, what is the law of nature, how do you know that there are eternal laws of nature? Is it falsifiable at all? How did you? But we teach this in schools, Newton's laws of nature, and he did that. And they say, what is this? You guys don't know laws. So there's a big debate with a Singapore and uh, with a in University of Science Malaysia, and uh, this was a minuted public debate. It is here. So I'll just show you that. I think uh, so you should uh, conclude yeah, now. You can take a look at it. It is there. I'll stop at that point. He could not give a single law of nature. Point I'm making is this is part of theological propaganda because he did a BSc from Singapore Bible College, but Cambridge gave him a PhD in history and philosophy of science. He did not know a word of science, but Cambridge gave him a PhD and therefore he had the. Are there any questions from the audience or on the chat box? Uh, let me stop sharing. Do you see any questions stop. there? Let me start with uh, yeah. uh, my question first. Maybe by then we can have a that. Uh, it's wonderful that uh, you have highlighted the fact that this NCRT uh, books uh, hardly take note of the fact that there was a large tradition of proofs and uh, reasoning in Indian science, uh, Indian mathematics in particular. And uh, in 1930s, Nilakantha's uh, Aryabhatiya Bhakshiya was published. So NCRT may say whatever. There are more than 25 works on uh, which contain Upabhattis and Yuktis, etc. Culminating with uh, Professor K.V. Sharma's uh, Ganita Yukti Bhasha in 2008. Uh, one thing I wanted to say that uh, this Charvakas perhaps uh, do not have any place in Indian mathematics per se. Uh, Nilakantha says uh, for proof, I mean, he goes not just back to Nyaya Sutras, he goes back to Taitri Aranyaka, that is Britihi Pratyaksham Aitishyam Anumanam Chatushtayam. And these are the four uh, Pramanas on which the entire Jyotisha and the Ganita Shastra are to be. Yes, Charabakars were against inference, and uh, that would have made a large part of uh, empirical science not possible. But uh, mathematics can still be done a little bit uh, by as much pratyaksha as possible. Uh, so this was one comment. Uh, the other comment is uh, that um, we have gone through the epistemological shortcomings of the greco european tradition. Uh, in a very profound way, you have outlined it in all your publications and you have tried to 
go through your corpus in a short way in, in half an hour. Uh, but the issue is not uh, uh, so much the shortcomings. I think these shortcomings are recognized partially by Europeans from time to time. Even Gurbakhi said that we know that uh, our deductions are not uh, going to lead to absolute truth and the contradiction may arise in uh, our mathematics. Because of this final ideas, we are confident that we are not going to see contradictions and therefore mathematics will not become trivial, that every statement will become true. So uh, I think it's, we need much more analysis of uh, other epistemological foundations that, because they are not going to change. It's a tradition which goes back to Plato uh, and the Christianity and the combination of both. It is not going to change. So I thought, what do you think? I mean, we have to really bring out the epistemological foundations of uh, Indian thought, Indian science, Indian mathematics in much more great uh, detail than we have been doing. Can I just add a footnote uh, to your uh, yeah. permission, Dr. Srinivas? Uh, uh, can I please respond to him? Otherwise, I'll forget. No, no, no. Uh, I, I just add a footnote. Okay. My only, I think it's very significant that you said that, you know, all Indian Vidyas have the same epistemological basis. You quoted one, but I mean, Nyaya Sutras also, there are different ideas of epistemon, epistemology. Yoga Sutras have epistemology. Pratyaksha, Anumana, Pramana, all that. Now, my question is, uh, in, in European science, that is not the case. After Vico, Vico himself realized this, there was a big split. Vico went one way after, De after Descartes, because he said in human affairs, okay. in human, in history okay. also, you cannot apply these, uh, this epistemology, which modern science, that is, uh, what Descartes and, and Bacon and others have done. So my question really is this, that this is really the crux. Now, as we see, uh, you know, the limitations of uh, objectivity and, uh, you know, modern science, is there any scope for a unified epistemology once again emerging? That is my question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, is there any scope for for a unified epistemology ah, okay. emerge. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, and I agree with you, that certainly we need to do more uh, research on the Indian side. That is fine. Agreed. But the idea that the West is not going to change, I disagree with that. Because I think that, uh, for example, when I gave this tubing and talk, so I am talking about Euclid as a symptom of racism as a way to cultivate racism. And I think that that is something which is, uh, uh, it is possible to create a strong movement on that basis, which will, which they would have to respond to. They can ignore one CK Raju, but they can't ignore all the blacks and they can't ignore the Muslims and they can't ignore the Chinese and so on and so forth. So when this point comes out that what is being taught through axiomatic mathematics is nothing but church superstition, then I think that there is going to be a major problem which uh, they have to respond to and uh, this church superstition led to racism and so on. That is the, uh, uh, what my giving and talk was about. That's why I call it Euclid must fall. So I think that that change is going to take place. Now, whether we get a unified epistemology is uh, not uh, really a question, you know, that is too ultimate a question. I am talking about whatever is a convenient epistemology today in order to enable us to do science today and tomorrow. And what will happen ultimately, nobody knows, right? So I wouldn't get into that, but I think there is nothing wrong in Pratyakshan Anuman. It is a perfectly fine uh, uh, set of uh, things to go ahead with, although it is fallible. I fully admit it is fallible. There is no idea of exact truth. There is no idea of eternal truth or anything of that sort. It is fallible and whenever it fails, then we revise whatever we have done. That's the best we can do. Are there any other questions or comments from the participants? We have still time for maybe one question or two questions. Maybe so. I will again pick up one more small question. Yeah. Uh, uh, last question, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you very promptly and correctly criticized uh, George Joseph for uh, talking of floating 
number in uh, Kerala mathematics or Indian mathematics. No, but uh, I think uh, we have to really understand uh, Indian mathematics in terms of our own categories. I agree. Before into something like that. Yeah. Because I see a tendency in you that you have this non Archimedean field concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, let me finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please finish. Non Archimedean field. Yes. Which is again not, I mean, we cannot find it in Nilakantha, Jeshta Deva, Bhaskara, Radhi Bhaskara. Can, can, can. Somehow come with a very proper understanding of their framework before I, we can jump into anything quickly like that. This was, a, I mean, a point of okay, caution. Okay, that. very good question. Very good question. Where I am saying that if you look at what Brahmagup did, what does Brahmagup do? He does polynomial arithmetic. So what is this non-archimedian arithmetic that I'm talking about? It is polynomial arithmetic. Okay. He does polynomial arithmetic, you agree? Yeah, yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so now once he's doing polynomial arithmetic, and if you see all the calculations that are done in the Yukti Bhasha and so on, I think that uh, in the Yukti Dipika and so on, I think that you very clearly have a method of discarding infinitesimal. For example, how does Nilkan come up with the uh, sum of the infinite geometric series? No, you are not geometric things, right? I was just cautioning you that yeah. quickly to jump to a modern category like a non archimedean no, no, no. I'm not jumping to a modern category. I'm just using the modern category. Yeah, yes, yes. Real yes. numbers yes. are the largest Archimedean field and uh, something larger. I don't believe like Archimedean exists. Mathematics once again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not going back to formal mathematics. I'm just no, using it for expository purposes because if I say Brahma Gupta, nobody will understand. If I say non archimedian arithmetic, people will at least understand what I'm no, talking about. No, no, Again, no, no. non archimedian arithmetic, there is no. Well, I don't even about the caveats. I think we can proceed and uh, <laughs> okay. there are so many studies and so many perspectives. So, thank you, Professor Raju, for a mm -hmm. uh, wonderful exposition of your ideas and your work. Thank you. Uh, now, we have Professor Kanmarkar, who is Professor in electrical engineering department in uh, IIT Madras. And he has been working on indigenous development, indigenous technological development for more than three decades. Uh, and he has worked with very eminent people. Uh, and uh, he has come up with a lot of uh, innovations here. So he's going to talk of indigenization of semiconductor technology, his experience. Uh, and uh, it's, it will be a pleasure to listen to him on how to attain. Today, even in the talk of this COVID vaccine technology, this uh, indigenization was the major bottleneck that uh, there's still perhaps 200 components that we import even for the indigenous vaccine of co vaccine. So uh, let's hear Kanmalkar and his experience. Professor Kanmalkar. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Professor M.D. Srinivas, uh, whom I have known uh, since uh, three decades. I would like to thank uh, Professor Makarand Paranspe and uh, Rajveer ji also for inviting me to give a talk. In fact, this is one of the rare occasions when I am amongst uh, humanities people. Uh, the prior uh, experience I have of faculty from humanities is uh, two decades ago, I proposed that all research scholars in IIT Madras should be oriented properly towards research through a course called Introduction to Research. And I proposed a uh, a two-part course where there is a common portion for all the research scholars from all departments, including humanities, and then there is a discipline-specific portion. So uh, there was a criticism from the humanities department that who is an engineer to tell us how we should be doing research. So uh, since then, I have always uh, had uh, exchanges with humanities uh, department faculty on various issues. So um, in that background, it is really a privilege to have been invited to speak on something like this. I am likely to be the odd man out because even the previous speaker, Professor Raju, uh, who made 
those interesting uh, uh, expositions uh, did connect to philosophy at least. Whereas I'm going to be just hard engineering. Okay. Now, uh, the first slide shows some monkeys, deers, and uh, trees. And this is because our IIT is known for this flora and fauna. So those of you who have not come to IIT Madras, I would definitely urge you to visit once to enjoy this uh, particular environment. So here is the outline of my talk. I'll start with what is the present scenario in this area. And then I will quickly cover a few basics related to technology, based on which then I will develop what was the motivation for semiconductor technology, how it evolved, and uh, its personality. So if one wants to practice this technology, <clears throat> what is it that one should be really aware of? And I will then summarize my talk by uh, noting the unique features of semiconductor technology. A couple of days ago, there was a news item: Indian manufacturing needs to go beyond, uh, to needs to grow beyond assembly. The points made were this: the big need now is to focus on indigenizing the manufacture of components, rather than host the cheapest high quality assembly lines. To this end, governments recently announced production linked incentive scheme incentivizes the indigenization of components in a graded manner along assembly lines. So for years, we have been talking about this indigenization related to components. About a year ago, there was this news item about one of the important components, namely the microchips why India must manufacture microchips. The points made in this article were that growth of electronic production units in India is impressive, yet their net value addition is merely 5 to 15% of the $2 trillion market as most components are imported. There are 170 commercial fabs globally. Please note the word commercial, right? We do have fabs, uh, which are managed by ISRO, DRDO, and all that, but they're not commercial. They are just for doing experiments. So there are 170 commercial flaps, commercial fabs, that is fabrication uh, units, semiconductor device fabrication industries, but none in India because setting up a fab requires rupees 15,000 crores capital. The next point is that high capital depreciation there is a high capital depreciation since fabs need to adopt newer technologies every 18 months to ensure competitiveness. This accounts for 50 to 60% of the product cost. And finally, domestic players have shown low interest in uh, setting up commercial fabs due to their inability to compete with tech giants in R&D and investment. So this is what is the present scenario. So let's try to understand this. Why is it like this? So one of the purposes of my talk would be to uh, sensitize the non-specialist audience about the nature of the semiconductor technology. So let me cover a few basics of technology quickly. So what do I mean by technology here when I use this word? Technology is a complete know-how of processing material, energy, or information into a useful product. Pictorially, you could depict it like this. You take either material, energy, or information and process it, and what you get is a product that is useful. We should not paint all of technology with the same brush. <clears throat> I find this particular difficulty that many people who talk about indigenization and indigenous technology development and so on, bracket several things which as according to me are distinct in the same category. So let me elaborate on this point. We can talk about three levels of technology, software, systems, and components. <clears throat> and now let's talk about the Indian capability for each of these levels. Software level, 
we are doing excellent. For example, we export software. Systems level, we are doing good. We build satellites and supercomputers. This is where we assemble uh, components to create systems, which are maybe high quality. However, components level technology in India is unsatisfactory. For example, we import the technology for making sewing needles, dry batteries and semiconductor devices. So it is not only that we import the technology for making microchips, which are semiconductor devices. We also import technologies for dry batteries and sewing needles. So what is common to these three needles, dry batteries and semiconductor devices? All these are materials oriented technologies. They involve processing of materials and they require a good understanding of materials if you want to practice it. Now, this is the key difference between components level technology and software and systems level technologies. Unless this difference is understood, we will have people saying that when we can have ISRO sending satellites in space, we should learn from uh, them and try to develop the area of semiconductor technology. So these kind of statements you hear, why can't we learn from our uh, successes in so exporting software, right? So when we can do well in these fields, why can't we do well in the area of components? We should be able to do. Yes, uh, we should do well, but then we must have a correct understanding and we should recognize the distinctions between these levels. So I'll elaborate on this one point a little bit. Now when processing conditions are stringent and the product has high reliability and high performance at low cost, then the technology is said to be high technology. So again, if you want to uh, show diagrammatically, in a technology in which processing conditions are stringent, and consequently, you get a product that has high reliability and high performance at lower cost. Then you say the technology is high technology. Now, if you use this terminology, then semiconductor technology, that is a technology of semiconductor based electronic components can be classified as materials oriented high technology. Finally, semiconductor technology is a reasonably good technology. So now, how do you decide the goodness of a technology? Here are some characteristics. A technology is said to be good if it yields cheap products accessible to everyone, if it is compatible with man's need for creativity. For example, if you take semiconductor technology, mobile phone is an example of that. It is accessible to everyone. And there are many other examples where the semiconductor use of semiconductor components makes the particular product accessible to everyone, compatible with man's need for creativity. I need not emphasize the amount of creativity that has been unleashed because of the presence of computers, which are consequence of semiconductor technology. Then it lowers consumption levels while improving the standards of living. When you use semiconductor uh, devices in various systems, your power consumption goes down, okay? The size of the uh, system goes down and so on. Then a good technology is suitable for small scale application and is inflation proof and recession proof. In, in these matters, the semiconductor technology is not necessarily uh, the ideal, but still it's not bad. So because semiconductor technology satisfies these conditions to a reasonable extent, we can say it is a reasonably good technology. Now, let's look at the motivation for this technology. What was the motivation? In 19... 20s and 30s, the vacuum tube, which is shown here, was used to make various electronic systems like amplifiers and so on. So here, what is shown is a computer. Based on vacuum tubes, you can see that it fills the entire room. Now, this vacuum tube is like an incandescent lamp, which has a few things inside. <clears throat> okay. Now, these devices based on vacuum tubes were big, fragile, and they used to dissipate a lot of heat, and they were unreliable. For example, it is said that this computer would uh, 
go down right often and it needed uh, many many engineers to keep it working continuously so in 1925 a patent was filed which said that try to implement this concept of the vacuum tube amplifier in a solid state <clears throat> that is in a semiconductor material and this was the diagram that was put in the patent this was the diagram suggesting the arrangement that should be used i am not going to get too technical about this because of the non specialist nature of the audience after 1925 when this patent was filed people started working on this idea and it took almost another two decades more than two decades to actually realize a working amplifier which which in fact did not correspond to this original concept and it this particular amplifier was an accidental discovery while trying to realize this particular device that was patented then after a decade uh, there was the invention of what is called the integrated circuit where the inventors proposed that several semiconductor devices can be simultaneously made on the same particular substrate and that way you can gain in terms of performance you can reduce the size you can reduce the power consumption and so on so in fact it is this idea that is that is said to have really revolutionized the entire electronics industry and today you have the entire computer on a chip so that is the reason why a uh, kilby was in fact given a nobel prize in physics though he is the only engineer to have been given a nobel prize in physics because the idea that he proposed made so many physicists work on the uh, operation of devices as they are miniaturized that so much new physics came out of this new idea now here is a comparison of how the computer was before 1947 and how the calculator is today you can hold it in the hand right it has so much more capability than this computer similarly other examples of semiconductor technology are micro sensor clusters right so you can wear this on your wrist and it will measure acceleration humidity temperature pressure and so on and this is an example of a smart pen so all this is because of the semiconductor technology so now let me elaborate on the personality of semiconductor technology so why is it that uh, what is the difficulty in indigenizing this when we can make satellites supercomputers and we can export software what's the reason that we are lagging behind so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take a very simple device and a semiconductor device and show how it will be made using the technology right uh, that is uh, available right now so this is in fact a device that is used in our uh, tv tuners and so on to change when you want to change channels okay you use this particular device it's a diode basically you try to use this as a capacitor i will not get more technical than this but let us see how this is made this is its construction okay i'm taking a very very simple structure deliberately because this is a non specialist audience so but they will understand the intricacies of the technology from here you can see the parts here you have glass and then you have the semiconductor chip and copper leads so i'm going to emphasize how a large variety of materials and processes are required to make a semiconductor device if i explored uh, this part semiconductor chip part it will look like this so you can see the multiple layers here you have p type silicon and n type silicon here this silicon has to be single crystal material perfect single crystal material now this is a very stringent condition okay this means ultra pure material and containing regularly arranged atoms because only then the device will function the way it is intended to be and then you have on this a silicon dioxide layer glass layer and you can see some metals nickel silver on this side and on the other side to connect this device to the external world 
then you bring in the two leads copper leads on the two sides and then you put the glass tube on it so that is called packaging so you package this particular semiconductor chip now this is what it is let's uh, get into the particular semiconductor part a little bit more this is what it is it has uh, three layers n type silicon layer that is silicon in which there is phosphorus p type silicon layer that is silicon in which there is boron and the glass how do we go about making this structure in fact so we don't make individual devices like this you make at once hundreds of devices on a single wafer this is the uniqueness of this technology you can see the example here each of these small squares is the particular one unit here so after making it like that and then you dice you cut you cut along these lines this way and then separate the parts as shown here so now this is how the high capital investment gets reduced to lower cost per device because large number of devices are made simultaneously let's see what are the steps and uh, for making this uh, particular device and which of the steps we can do within india and we, for which of the steps we have to import now you, you start with n type silicon okay phosphorus uh, silicon with phosphorus impurity you have to start with sand make a big ingot like this and then slice that ingot into these wafers this is what this particular piece is now we do not have in india a unit for making this so we need to import this thing so starting substrate itself we have to import from abroad some efforts were made to set up commercial crystal growth facilities but they have not been successful this particular process was invented in 1918 so here i have given this information to show that uh, the technology developed in us and europe because of a number of inventions which were put together now then you have to create a silicon dioxide layer on this that is done by putting this particular device on uh, this particular silicon piece in a furnace at 1000 degrees or 1100 degrees this furnace is a simple thing so this part of the process and the equipment also can be made in india then comes the crucial part how do you create patterns in this this step is called lithography now uh, so the two people associated with this particular process are alois senefelder 1798 and andres who applied this particular printing technology to the area of semiconductors now this particular process needs to be carried out in an ultra clean room okay and you can see the person wearing a gown and so on as you see nowadays in covid times right so these are the stringent conditions required for processing this is where cost is involved so you coat this with a photosensitive material and then you create a mask which has the pattern you want to transfer to make the device and you expose it to light so this is an example of that this is a sophisticated equipment so in india for example you don't have anyone making this exposure unit you have to import it and then you develop as you do in a uh, photo as you do in photography to remove the photoresist from the exposed portion and then you use a chemical to remove the glass layer that etches the glass the chemicals that you use also have to be ultra pure why you see the impurity phosphorus in silicon that is used as the silicon that is used as starting point the phosphorus impurity is to the level of one atom in 10 power 8 silicon atoms of that order or one atom in 10 power 5 silicon atoms that is the impurity level that small is the scale of the impurity right so only then the device functions properly now if you want to process such ultra pure silicon you obviously can't have unclean air unclean chemicals and so on so these chemicals also are not made in india right they are imported 
Then you remove the photoresist, which was used to transfer the atom to this particular layer. Now here, I just want to uh, connect my dis technical discussion to some discussions which happened in the previous session, which was on the contributions of Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sang, RSS, right? Uh, I also happen to be a Swayamsevak. So when I when people ask me about what is the role of RSS, I tell them that the role of RSS is like this photoresist. You see, this photoresist is one of the most crucial elements in making the device. If you want to make small patterns, you need to have very high quality polymer material. Okay, and the development of this particular material has been one of the key reasons for development of the technology and miniaturization. But this particular uh, material ultimately does not appear in the device. Okay, it's a sacrificial material. But without this, you uh, do not get the device. So I tell that the role of Sung is RSS, something like that. It is very crucial to achieve certain uh, developments in the society. But the organization itself may not appear to be visible, though its effects will be there. And because of it, certain developments would have taken place. That is why in Sung, we uh, try to say, we try to build or develop the sense of sacrifice. So anyway, coming back to the technical part, after that, you need to create a silicon layer, which has more of boron. And this is again done at high temperature. This part again can be done within India. The complete process is called planar process and was invented by Hoerni in 1957. So these are the timelines in which these things happen. Now, uh, the contribution of Kilby and Noyce, as I said, Kilby was given Nobel Prize in physics for his invention of integrated circuit was that you can make several devices on the same substrate and interconnect them. This looks like a very simple, but this is the revolutionary idea that has been responsible for building of computers today and miniaturization of entire computing resources. So this is how it looks today. This was the idea in 1959, and this is how it has developed. Today, Using this technology, many other things are being done. For example, here is an example of an accelerometer, which is again done in silicon by etching out parts of it using the same technology that was developed to make diodes, transistors, and so on. So now, let me uh, do a summary of what we have done so far. So what is the takeaway from all of this? These are the unique features of semiconductor technology, which we must be aware of if we want to indigenize. Okay, and this also tells what are the challenges in indigenization of semiconductor technology. Though we are able to build computers and so on, uh, why are we not able to build devices? One unique feature of this technology is that science came first and then came the empiricism or our development of processes, unlike glass and steel technologies. Glass and steel are also material technologies, but the history of development of the technology shows that it is not as though people knew the molecular, uh, they had a understanding of the molecules in glass or atoms in steel and so on, right? They, through trial and error and intuition, they developed the uh, technology of these materials. Only later, very recently, the structure of this was understood and that further helped in development. That is true. But then, so glass and steel, empiricism first, science later. But for semiconductors, science first. And only after that, the material technology developed. Next point is that it requires stringent processing conditions, perfect single crystal material. A lot of money has to be spent to get a material as a starting point. And it needs ultra clean environment, gases, chemicals, and sophisticated equipment. Products become easier to use but this is the advantage. Products become easier to use when technology advances. This is very interesting. And this is in contrast to other technologies. For example, if you take automobile technology, it is easy to ride a bike, but you need a license to ride a scooter or a car. And it is even more difficult to ride an aircraft. Right? So as technology advances, you need higher skill in the case of other technologies. Whereas for semiconductor technology, the other way around. 
when the technology advances, the products become more and more easy to use. And another great advantage of semiconductor technology is that performance of new products can be predicted using relatively simple models because the products are mostly made in single crystal material. A single crystal material is difficult to make, but easy to analyze. Okay, so that is the advantage. So finally, we can say that semiconductor technology is capital intensive, rapidly advancing, reasonably good, highly interdisciplinary and materials oriented high technology. Because of our weakness in materials, understanding of materials and research on materials, we have not been able to indigenize this technology uh, to the fullest extent. So mostly what we have been doing is, we have been doing at the final stages, that is packaging the device. So you import the semiconductor pieces and so on, and just package them. So units we have, commercial units which we have, are mostly packaging units. That is why the value addition is very low. I think I'll stop with that and see if people have understood my talk and they have any questions. Thank you, Professor Kanmalkar. Uh, I just ask you first a general question and then open it to the audience. Uh, it's indeed surprising that um, even after 78 years after our independence, we still have uh, this great level of difficulty uh, in uh, indig indigenizing uh, important technologies like semiconductor technology. And uh, as you said, the crucial problem is with the materials. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the issues I wanted to ask you was since you have been also a teacher, uh, don't you see that in our uh, engineering education as such, the importance of this all round understanding of different aspects of technology uh, from the software to the up to the component uh, is perhaps that uh, sort of wholeness is lacking in our engineering education because uh, maybe in IITs etc. We have to specialize and go for something, but we produce a large number of engineers who sort of uh, if they were given this understanding of materials, they would perhaps be doing something about it. Yes, uh, you have made a very valid point. In fact, I am a BTEC from IIT and I had done courses on semiconductor technology. But I never knew that a sewing needle and dry battery, which we import, is for the same reason for which we import semiconductor technology. So this perspective, this perspective is not given. So this is very important. Uh, what, what happens is we simply read uh, books. Uh, that is why I pointed this out. This whole thing developed uh, elsewhere. We read the books and then we simply impart uh, that knowledge without trying to bring in the connection to our Indian environment. So that part is lacking. So we are so uh, we are intelligent, talented people, but without uh, feeling for our society. So that is uh, that is the important thing. So this perspective that you know why the technology, uh, what is the nature of the technology, and how it's, it is connected to economics and other things. So these parts are not discussed to the same extent and to the same depth. It is very important. Okay, I will now leave it to other questions which may be coming in from the participants. And uh, in the I would like to make a brief uh, comment. Uh, uh, please, please go ahead, please go ahead. Dr. Bajaj wants to say something. Uh, uh, listening to Karmal Kher, sir, uh, I have known him for very long. Uh, it reminded me of uh, one of the pioneering uh, technologists who talked about uh, technology, Sivaraj in technology, uh, I'm referring to Sri Jagmohan Garg, whom Kirmal Kirjir knows very well. Yes. And uh, uh, this is 30 years ago, 40 years ago, he used to talk about the same issue that Indian engineers seem to be very good in uh, systems engineering. Software was not that high at that time. And he regretted that uh, we have no interest in component engineering and materials. And he thought no engineering is possible unless we do component engineering and we do uh, our own materials. And so he, in fact, very proudly used to call himself a component engineer rather than a systems engineer. And he was very unhappy with most of the IITs, thinking uh, he believed all of them are doing only uh, systems engineering. I'm raising this issue because 
it is with us for 40 years now or maybe longer but also because i think people like jigmohan gadji uh, who was the pioneer uh, person in talking about uh, swaraj in technology when now we have started talking about swaraj in ideas and issues like that i think we should remember people like him maybe the ic should arrange some meeting on his ideas and or maybe Dr. Pranjpe should sometime think about because many engineers will know about him. Uh, I'm sure the engineering technology in India has improved much since then. But uh, the original question he raised between the balance between the systems engineering and comfort in engineering still remains. Yeah. So I, I want to just uh, add uh, uh, to what you have said. So. Um, after I got, I got this, I developed this perspective only during the two years I took leave from IIT and uh, was with him uh, to work to indigenously develop the you know device. So I had to go from one place to another place just to make a high quality diode. And it, it is only then that I understood that you know what is the difficulty. The, the, the problem is that the industry um, in the area of semiconductors is not very advanced. But the research, researchers in uh, centers of excellence like IIT, where semiconductor technology is discussed in other places, it is not even discussed to that extent. They are more interested in working on current uh, problems. And therefore, they concentrate on publications. So result of this is, there are some publications in good journals, but you never have the hang of the entire, of all the process steps of the technology. So this, this is the problem. Okay, so... Uh, what, what I have been doing is, what I have been doing is, I have always set aside time to interact with industries. If one industry doesn't work, another industry. If it doesn't work, let's try another industry. So that is what I have been doing, right? So I as just late as, I, I just, I will complete. As late as a uh, few months ago, I have come to know of an industry in Gujarat, of something of that type, which I have not found elsewhere. And now it is uh, trying to get into silicon carbide material, semiconductor devices. So um, I'm trying to see if I can, you know, collaborate with them and there I can be, uh, you know, uh, from India. Because this person who is uh, trying to set up this uh, plant is in the U.S. He has a similar plant in the U.S. and he wants to transfer that here. Yeah. No, I just wanted to add, uh, to remember Jagmohan Gherji. He yeah. was uh, uh, a lifetime Swam Sevak. He was all but a Pracharik, except that he didn't, uh, he never married. And yes. he was, uh, uh, he was a Sangha Chalak of very large regions. Uh, I just want to remember that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, can, 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 come, come, can I uh, come Dr. in? Uh, I Dr. very much sympathize with this because some uh, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, when we were building this uh, CDAC supercomputer, every time I used to meet the secretary, he would ask me one question. Are we now self-sufficient? <laughs> I had to tell him that is not wrong. Every time he would ask this question and then so many secretaries are there. That is what they understood. And uh, we had a VLSI facility in Chandigarh, which burned down, whether it was right. Chandigarh or what is to be seen. Right. And uh, we never built another. And in fact, at one time, Kalam had come and he was suggesting that we should start building a chip. So the question is, as you said, the capital investment in building a chip is very high. Yes. And then if you are bureaucratic about it, <laughs> then all your investment is sunk. No, no, that, that is one thing. Uh, that is yeah. one thing. Other thing is every 18 months, you have to develop the technology yourself. That is another yeah. problem. Exactly, yes. that's the point. That is also true with uh, if you are chip building because if you are not uh, you are not um, uh, constantly upgrading, it will go out of date and it will be just yeah. thrown. I think of all the chips, three eight six, four eight six. They are so dead, so extinct. <laughs> but so in fact, I don't think so once upon a time. Yeah. So in fact, that unit is there now. ISRO has taken over, so it is not a commercial unit. That is a that is a point. It is not a commercial unit. Uh, Professor Paranjpe that we need also to reform our bureaucracy because the bureaucracy is a very major impediment in trying to do something of this sort because huge investments are required which the state has to make 
and the bureaucracy tries to control. That's a big, big, big problem. Professor Parangs Bay had some questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to come in for a second when I heard about uh, uh, Mr. Uh, you know Jagmohan Garchi, yeah. who, of course, uh, you know he founded Garg Associates and in Ghaziabad, and then he, I think, returned to the U.S. If I'm not mistaken, and he also donated very generously. Uh, to many good causes. The thing I wanted to mention is there is a chair named after him. In IIT IIT Kanpur. Kanpur. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So that is so it's not so bad. We do remember. And the only other thing I wanted to say is that it should be it would be a good idea to have an annual uh, lecture in his name or something like that. That was one idea. The other thing I wanted to ask actually. Uh, to both uh, to both uh, Shivaji as well as to uh, Sita Rajuji, you know, you remember the the mysterious uh, plane crash of Homi Baba. You just mentioned this thing blowing up in Chandigarh, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I'm wondering. See, I'm, uh, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here, but uh, you know, the more and more I look at the world, the more and more I see there are so many forces at work. And many of them, sometimes you call them the deep state, you call them something else. But they are at work beneath the surface to sabotage, to discourage. Uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned the bureaucracy. Now, many of these forces are penetrated into the bureaucracy as well. So that uh, you don't have a free hand if you want to do something. So I would like your comments on this, please, both of you. Yeah, and Malte. So, uh, so um, uh, it looks like uh, parts of bureaucracy are responsive. Uh, that is why I mentioned. See, in January, I visited this factory, these Ratan Shah semiconductors, where a secretary-level person from government had come to inaugurate this uh, facility for expand. Now it is a facility for making silicon devices. Uh, it is going to be expanded to make silicon carbide power devices, which are very, very important for all high power applications. So they are trying to um, see how these things can be facilitated. So parts of bureaucracy seem to be responsive, but the issue is this. Uh, people who are uh, involved in uh, framing the policies, uh, what I find is they don't have a good idea of what this technology is all about. I feel some uh, training uh, process, at least a two, three hour lecture, to tell them, you know, what is the uniqueness of this technology? I think that is very important. This is one thing I have found. For this policy Yeah, we gave one such lecture to the secretary of the Department of Electronics after touring the entire country and telling him about, you know, there was a UN expert. And uh, at the end of a one hour lecture, ultimately he did what he knew. He quoted uh, from Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we fail, or you could say, we fail. <laughs> so that is what he understood. And he, he toured the country, you know, did all this and gave him the briefing. So I am, I will keep my mistake on it. You know, it's only so much you can get across in a lecture. The okay. other point that you raised about Homi Baba, I would mm -hmm. like to say two things. I think uh, two or three things maybe. First of all, the Tatas were very interested in computer technology way back, right at the time of Kusambi. He was uh, sent to study this technology. And in fact, when I was in TIFR as a student, you know, for the bubble chamber group, I used to walk around. They were building a computer called ODAP. They're building it so badly that I, should, I used to walk through it and pull all the wires here. And, there. <laughs> and the thing never worked for a single day. But the other part, the conspiracy part, Paulus Mar Gregorius told me, and he was he did the service for this uh, plane crash victims, and he was quite convinced that uh, it was a conspiracy. On the other hand, if you look at Baba himself, I mean, frankly, he has been glorified, but he was a very mediocre person. He did something with his, uh, you know, he hired some Jewish. Uh, a refugee Hitler with whom he did something which is today called Baba Hitler scattering. But you see the papers that he wrote after he came back to India, they were miserable. 
And I think that, uh, so there are two sides of the coin. Maybe somebody misunderstood and killed him, but, you know, what he did, but he, as a manager, he had complete clout because he had direct access to the prime minister. He used to write bhai and he had complete clout to do whatever he wanted. Okay. Uh, I think you, thank you very much, Raju. Uh, Dr. Raju and Dr. Kanmalkar to conclude this session. No, I think uh, these... He has a question. Right. Huh? There's a question? I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Makran has a question. Uh, please. Uh, I think we are already running out of time. Make it brief, sir. Yes, yes, yes. I know because... Uh, uh, louder. You are, I think, not audible. I'm saying uh, I know because Dr. Bajaj has also joined, but the thing I want to say is it's not so much conspiracy and all that, but, you know, I think uh, Shibaji said that we don't have a feel for society, one of the things he said. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to talk about, and maybe this can just go on in the next session, the disconnect between society and technology. You see, I'm, what I want to say is it's not that we don't have a feel for society alone, but we don't have a feel for science and technology. You see, in, in circles of government, I mean, barring a few exceptions, I've had a chat about this with Vijay Raghavanji also, many people do not understand the difference between science and technology. If somebody is a great engineer, they'll say, oh, he's a great scientist. Yes, yes. So, so my, my, my so, submission so, is... Yeah, yeah. Paranjpaji, so I want to I'd say that that's why, in fact, all this perspective I got and I have developed talks on each of these. What is the difference between science, engineering and invention? So I give a talk on that. <laughs> Akranji, you, you have something more to say? You please uh, okay. conclude, you conclude. Uh, okay. So, uh, I just wanted to make one remark before concluding. Um, you see, the, uh, while the need for Swaraj in ideas in various domains, are perhaps uh, uh, there is no debate, uh, I think the scientific and technological community, uh, the way they are trained, uh, they somehow seem to feel that these are universal domains at least in the post-independence era. And uh, so even the talk of uh, Swaraj in ideas in science or technology is considered uh, sort of uh, perhaps uh, antithetic to the growth of science. Uh, the best example was uh, a, a letter by more than 800 uh, scientists uh, to our uh, prime minister uh, that this Atmanirbharata is helping their uh, research. This call for Atmanirbharata, this was in the first week of April or something like that. So there is not even a recognition uh, in this domain. Whereas 100 years ago, if we look up our great scientists, like Dr. Chandra Jagdish Chandra Bose, or later Raman, they were very clear that uh, that the nationalism is as much important for growth of science as our uh, keenness to do science and technology, as our uh, learning in science and technology. So this debate is very important. I'm very grateful to the uh, You wanted to say something? Yeah. Very short, very short uh, statement. So uh, in our department, electricity department, when I was a uh, since uh, the time I was have been a student, I saw photos of scientists and uh, engineers, inventors on the walls. And very interestingly, not a single photo of an Indian was there. So I asked mm -hmm. my teachers, why is, for example, Jagdish Chandra Bose uh, thing is not there? Why nobody answered uh, anything? So what I did was when I was made in charge of a new lab, so there I put the photo of Jagdish Chandra Bose and what, what is his contributions and so on. Okay, thank so, you. So I'm grateful to Dr. Makrat Panjipay for giving me this opportunity to join this session. Thank you very much to everybody. I'll hand over the mic back to Thank you. This was a very rich session. We could have gone on. Uh, and uh, obviously, I, I didn't want to interrupt because the next session is going to be chaired by Professor Kalmalkar. So I said he will be, he is responsible. So he will know where to end it. But so, uh, I, I will yeah. simply go to him uh, uh, with the, uh, and unless, uh, unless Professor 
Rajvi Sharma ji wants to say a few words by way of a segue, by way of a connection between this session and the next session. Please, sir, aap do teen shabd kya ke? We'll hand it over to uh, Professor Kalmalkar, and I want to thank Professor Shrinivas very much, and I request him if he has some time to stay on, and then at the end of the next session, if he wants to comment on what uh, what uh, Jatendra ji has said. Or uh, you know, if he wants to comment on uh, what Lavanya ji, but she's going to talk about history. Doesn't matter. If uh, if he wants to wait a little bit and come in, we want to hear from him and his own journey, his own journey at MIDS and at other places. Not MIDS, the other. What what the acronym is? I forgot right now. Go ahead. Yes. 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 Okay. Oops. Uh, Professor Sharma, would you like to say something? Uh, sir, Sharma? I think we can we can proceed to the next session because we are running uh, yeah. out of time. Okay, okay so okay. yeah, so I will. Uh, I have the privilege of starting the next session. I won't speak much. Uh, so the first speaker is uh, Professor Bajaj. Again, like Professor Shrinivas, I have known him for uh, three decades. A physicist by training. Uh, but uh, I regard him as a critical thinker. That is the way I will describe him because I've heard him and we have met and also interacted on several things. One of them being uh, uh, preparing a petition uh, which many uh, people in, uh, many faculty in IIT Madras in fact signed. And that was the first such occasion when a non-leftist group of faculty uh, came out with a petition about some social issues. Okay, so uh, that is about uh, Professor Bajaj. I think uh, with this, I will request Professor Bajaj to start his sessions. I will introduce uh, Dr. Lavanya uh, before her, her talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Karmalkar. And uh, uh, namaskar to all those who have joined this session, uh, either through WebEx or through Facebook. Unfortunately, we are in times when the speaker and the audience cannot greet each other face to face, but let us hope that uh, soon there will be the possibilities that we'll have more human interactions rather than having these virtual technological interactions with each other. I also want to, uh, at the beginning, thank Professor Pranjape, uh, the Director of uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies and Professor Rajavir Sharma, the convener of this uh, uh, very important uh, seminar for organizing the seminar and for giving me the opportunity to participate in it. Uh, this uh, thought of the idea of uh, Swaraj in ideas uh, seems to have acquired a, and uh, I'm very happy about it, it has acquired a uh, salience in Indian academic life over the last uh, perhaps seven, eight years. Many conferences, many seminars are being organized, uh, many large manthans are being carried out. And uh, uh, I do hope and I believe this must be leading to a major churning in the academic world of India and something important will come out of it. Today I want to talk about uh, an effort at uh, Swaraj in ideas or what the other way it's called is to change the narrative to in a national, changing the narrative to a nationalist direction an effort uh, which was made in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, by a great Gandhian historian, Sri Dharampal. Uh, this also happens to be the uh, centenary year of uh, Sri Dharampal. He was born on 19 February, 19, 
2021 uh, at Kandla in uh, in Western UP. Uh, many of you will be aware that he spent several years, maybe uh, almost a decade, in the British archives on India, British Indian archives, to look at how India looked uh, before the British came to India. The India that the British saw when they came here, what kind of India it was in its various dimensions. And out of that, uh, uh, his uh, studies into the archives, a significant corpus of literature came out. Uh, it, uh, uh, we have actually republished five of his books uh, in a very beautiful edition on uh, this February 1921, we were able to do it in spite of the COVID. And uh, no, what these books uh, gave a completely new uh, narrative of uh, what was the science and technology of India before the British came, what was education and literacy in India before the British came, and what was the uh, uh, the political system and the relationship between the ruler and the ruled, and the rights and privileges of people at large in their organizations like the Jati and Gram Sabha that they had in the in the polity. Uh, all of this is extremely interesting, and uh, it really gives you a new way of looking at the at India much different than what is taught in the histories that we read and the sociologies and anthropologies that we read. It's a completely different world that uh, Dharampal, you opened for us. Uh, but he was able to do it uh, because he uh, spent that time of maybe seven, eight, nine years in the archives in Britain and collected a large amount of rigorous data and information. And one thing I've learned from Dharambalji and his work is that no new narrative can be built on old data. Uh, if you want to have your, uh, your narrative, you have to discover your data. You have to, you have to do the research to produce that information that supports the narrative you believe in. So the Swarajin ideas has to be built on Swarajin data and Swarajin information. And that is a painstaking uh, process. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes passion that Dharampalji had. And uh, it takes, of course, uh, academic rigor. Uh, that's one of the, uh, when I said that I'll talk about the foundational prerequisites of idea, uh, Surajin ideas, this is one thing I want to flag, that you need to collect data at a very large level. And data not only in the archives, which Dharampalji did, but as he used to tell us, that uh, archival data is only one part of the data that we need. We also need data at the micro level about India, about its geography, about its history, about its people, their sociology, their the way they think, the way they, uh, they believe, uh, what do you think is right and what do they think is wrong, what are their preferences, and what is their conception of their history. Now, again, this is not ready-made available you have to go down to the micro level and, uh, and record things. And Dharmbalji was keen that uh, we should do this kind of recording for, if not for every locality of India, at least for every district of India. Uh, following him, I was able to work on a few districts of Madhya Pradesh. And I'd like to give an example of how working at that level changes your perspective. 
The example I'm giving you is from Bundelkhand. And uh, from what we read about Bundelkhand in the books and the newspapers, it feels like, it sounds like some godforsaken land which is perpetually hungry and perpetually thirsty. And I have gone to several districts of Bundelkhand from village to village. It is nothing of that. It's a very rich land. Rich in its geology, rich in its geography. Maybe the rainfall is not that high as it should be, at, as we we will expect in the in the Ganga Maidan. And extraordinary history, extraordinary confidence in the people. And you go to Bundelkhand, you think you are in a new world. Uh, the, when you interact with people, the kind of confidence they have. And soon I realized that confidence comes from the fact that Bundelkhand is one land uh, which throughout the last 1200 years or more uh, was never ruled by an alien ruler. Neither the Mughals nor the British were able to set up direct rule there. Though of course uh, the kings there had to pay tribute to, had to interact with, had to have relations with both the Mughals and the and the British because nobody was. Uh, but the local rule was not of the deputy commissioner. Local rule was not of the Mughal Subeda. It was of the of the uh, kings of Bundelkhand. Uh, earlier it was the Chandelas, and then there were the Bundelas. And it makes a lot of difference. It makes a different world. When, when you go to a place which has not been directly colonized or directly conquered. Anyway, but that's not what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, because of its peculiar geography and geology, the Bundelkhand is deficit in water. But when you go there, one of the things you notice is that the whole, whole land is dotted with a variety of water bodies, extremely beautiful water bodies. Almost every kilometer you will find one of those. Uh, very well structured, very deep occasionally. Uh, some of them probably irrigating thousands of uh, hectares of land. And when I read the uh, gazetteer of uh, uh, Tikamgad, which is one of the core states of Orcha state, of Bundelkhand, the gazetteer says that uh, there are these water bodies. It estimates that uh, in Tikam district, Tikam district alone, which is about uh, which is one of the smaller districts of the country, uh, there must have been there must be around uh, 962 water bodies built by the Chandelas. And then it says uh, that uh, though these water bodies are there, they are neither built for drinking water nor for irrigation. Uh, the word used is they were rather adjuncts to the palaces and uh, to the temples and to the luxury resorts of the kings of that time. Uh, this, this phrase bothered me. And uh, I found that I find that the Tikam district uh, website even now carries that that statement. Uh, so when I was going around, I uh, stood on the bank of one of the most important uh, water bodies. It's called the Beer Sagar uh, uh, Tala. Beer uh, Bahadur Banda Beer Bahadur was one of the uh, most valiant of the. Bundela kings. It was. It is in the, his name that this uh, water body was made, and it was on the bank of bank of uh, standing on the banks of it in a village called Nayakeda. I was talking to the Dhimars uh, who live in that village. Dhimars are fishermen, is a caste of fishermen, but they also are excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, cultivators, because they cultivate the banks of the of the uh, tank and when the water recedes they cultivate the bed. 
So I was talking to them. He, they were telling me what do they do for, for fishing? How do they buy seeds? How they, do they uh, cooperate to do various services? Because after all, a tank has to be used cooperatively. It cannot be used otherwise. Various things they were telling me. And then suddenly, uh, uh, one of them said, Sir, for us, this is a tree. If this is a tree, then we are. If this is not a tree, then we are not. That we have only this, uh, this uh, water body to live on. If the water body is living, we live. If the water body is dead, we are dead. Now, this is the perspective change. The perspective of the collector who wrote that uh, that uh, 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 gazetteer and said that these water bodies of no use to anybody except for the luxurious living of the kings of that place and the perspective of this Dhima who thinks that this is his life lying. And uh, you cannot get, you cannot change this perspective unless you go and talk to these people at the at the level of the village, at the level of the district, see how how various things affect them and what is their thinking pattern. Uh, that kind of information changes narratives. Uh, if you keep on any amount of working on the gazetteers and other kind of library information uh, based on the data that the British collectors collected, is not going to change the narrative. You can turn a phrase here or there, you can change the sentence, but uh, that will change the narrative, that's very doubtful. That's one thing. So that kind of uh, data we need to collect. I want to give more, one more example, and then I'll move to something else. We uh, infect with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Dharampalji's idea that he gave us, we have recently written a book on one of the localities of Tamil Nadu near uh, near Chennai. Uh, there are various things to talk about that locality, but I want to draw attention to one particular aspect of it. This locality we discovered. Uh, this is a small locality. It's not a very big place. It's a it is a small town of maybe thousand four hundred people or something like, or maybe a little more. Uh, this locality has 55 inscriptions uh, running from 1153 to 1726. You read through those inscriptions and you get an idea of uh, uh, the history of uh, from around 1200 to around 1800. The whole history is written down in those, those uh, but you also get an, of, uh, get an idea of how history expressed itself in this place. And what is the relationship the people of this locality and the king and the Chakra Chakravarti beyond him? And what you discover is very strange. In all of this, out of these 55, only five, all of them mention the king uh, when they mention the year as a, as a marker of time, they mention the Chakravarti of that time. But only five of them relate to the king or his representative. The rest of the all of them, the 50 of them, are about transactions of the people between themselves, transactions of the people with the what we will call the Gram Sabha, with the Uruvar, transactions of the people, what we what is called the temple sabha. And those transactions are interesting. And the People undertaking those transactions are interesting. Out of the various donations that uh, some of these inscriptions record in stone, uh, there'll be several donations by, by uh, Devadasis, whom today we think were some, some very low in the hierarchy. But these Devadasis are entering into a contract with the, with the Sabha of the Brahmins that this is the amount she is paying and in return this sabha undertakes to light a lamp on this particular day every day in the in the memory of her, her mother 
till eternity. And so what was the kind of relationship where between the Devadasi and the Brahmin, where the Brahmin is undertaking in return for a certain money given, undertaking and writing it down in stone, that we will perform this service for this Devadasi for eternity. And amongst these people to whom the, uh, the Brahmin Sabha is willing to do this service, there are barbers and uh, there are, of course, Vedyas. And what I want to point out is there's, there's one inscription uh, where the donation is from a Vedya. And the inscription writes, Swarna Vedya. And the You're back. You're back. You were gone for a few minutes, but you're back now. Go oh. ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry about it. Go ahead. How many minutes have we lost? Anyway. Just two minutes. Just two minutes. Oh. Okay. You were talking about inscriptions and uh -huh. how they were about transactions between people uh -huh. uh, and, and not royal edicts. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So what I was, uh, what I was saying was that these people involve what today we will call uh, low caste or whatever the kind of terms that we use. And uh, as I said, there are Devadasis and there are barbers, very large number of Devadasis. And these transactions are essentially the Devadasi is saying that I am giving this amount of money. And in return for that money, the Brahmin Sabha of the, of the locality uh, undertakes to perform the service of lighting a lamp every year in the memory of our mother for eternity. Uh, that is the kind of relation you have between the, uh, between the Devadasi and the, and the Brahmin Sabha. But that Brahmin Sabha is doing the same service for a barber and for several other people of, the, of that kind. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, one of these inscriptions res refers to a, a contract between a Vedya and the Brahmins. And uh, while writing, they refer to that Vedya as Swarna Vedya. And there is this Mahalingam who has collected these inscriptions on behalf of the ICHR. He puts a note there that, uh, uh, you know, perhaps all these services were available only to the Swaranas, to the higher castes. But he doesn't put any note when he comes across the, or the inscription where a barber is making the donation to the to the temple and the Brahmins are undertaking that service. He doesn't think of putting any similar note when he finds several inscriptions talking about Devadas is making that donation. So that is what uh, I will say that unless you read those kind of things, unless you record those histories, you will not know, you will like uh, uh, that Mahalingam you will keep believing that what we have read about the hierarchical society of India, that must be true in those inscriptions also. So uh, collecting micro level data, micro level sociology, micro level history at a very large scale is extremely important if we uh, want to bring Swaraj in ideas, because as I repeated earlier, Swaraj in ideas is built on information collected by ourselves, collected from the lowest levels. And incidentally, this kind of information keeps getting collected in uh, non-colonized societies. The world over, uh, in, I've seen the people work at the, uh, collect information about the villages, about the various guilds. About the, this is the bread and butter of much of sociology and much of history in most of the world, most parts of the world is only in India that uh, we are, our social scientists are mostly engaged with some, some high ideas and don't get down to actually looking at uh, what people are thinking and what people are doing, what are their histories, what their preferences, what is their genius. So that one aspect that we must have data and we must organize uh, begin organizing to collect that kind of data at a very large level. The other uh, uh, thing, other uh, prerequisite of Swarajan ideas that Dharampalji drew our attention to 
is the uh, categories uh, for a bet lack of a better word i'm using that term for the categories that we use for observing and for analyzing uh, dharmpal ji himself uh, when he had collected all this data towards the end of uh, uh, after completing all this he became very wary that he has only put together the material aspects of indian society and the mind which creates this all these aspects genius out of which all these varied aspects of indian society emerge and that mind has escaped him that uh, he has collected the physical material data but he has no apprehension comprehension of the mind from which all these political systems all these technologies all these uh, sciences all these uh, uh, education systems uh, emerged and then uh, md shrinivas if he is still sitting he in fact made md shrinivas collect some 200 uh, books uh, almost the whole classical indian corpus of the vedas of uh, shastras of the uh, uh, of uh, itihasas and puranas and i think he spent about 2 years going through it uh, just uh, he was uh, just passing through leafing through the whole whole lot of it he he could read very fast and then he decided to write this small book bharatiya chitta manas and kal and uh, i am happy that i was associated with the creation of that book in the sense that he talked on uh, uh, on tape uh, Uh, uh of what he was thinking and i transcribed it in hindi and then later translated into english but what he is telling us there is that uh, this data is all right that has to be there anyway but you will get no idea of what this data means till you don't know in what categories the people of india think what are the categories that the people of india use when talking to each other when what are the categories people of india use when they are they are comprehending their history what power means for them uh, what uh, ethics means for them what do they think is good and bad what is desirable what is undesirable you will get no idea of this by merely collecting data or looking at the categories that was just created for you and uh, in this book actually the bharatiya chitta manaskal is an urgent call for the indians to to start thinking of start, create a framework within which they can think and away from the colonial framework and one main thing is telling us there is that to go to this framework uh, uh, there is no other source except the indian classical literature uh, is only the civilizational literature of a of a people that lets you gives you access to the mind of the people to mind of that civilization to their sense of time and their sense of good and bad there's no other easy way of course the you you could be uh, like a sadhu going around and talking to thousands of people maybe you'll get some comprehension of it but the simpler way that tech, all those uh, uh, categories are getting defined in the classical civilization literature of india so this is the other uh, point i want to make that unless we get somehow our educated people start taking this literature seriously uh, for analysis for observation and Uh, have some access to it dharmpal ji was saying that we should not wait for everybody to learn sanskrit in whichever language we have access to this we should start respecting it and start creating our categories on the basis of quick uh, he used to say you make a quick uh, format we'll keep improving upon it but unless you have that uh, set of categories uh, a framework before you there is no way you can even proceed any further towards the direction of surajin ideas so that's the other important uh, uh, 
a prerequisite of uh, uh, of uh, Swarajin ideas they wanted to uh, bring to your attention. One that we must have uh, our own collection of data on all aspects of Indian society. The other, we must approach the data and the people and our analysis on the basis of what the classical Indian civilization has defined to be the way of thinking, way of behaving, way of being. And unless we do that, Suraj in ideas is going to be fairly complex and difficult. And once again, just as all over the world, uh, data at the micro level about the society is continuously collected. That's the, uh, as I earlier said, this is the bread and butter of the social sciences all over the world. Uh, and similarly, all over the world, uh, making people educated, part of uh, making people educated is to make them aware of their civilizational being. Make them aware of how their civilization thinks and behaves and what their civilization thinks is high and low. Uh, there are many literature people here. I don't think there's any great novel of the world which could have been written without knowing, without the author being fully seeped in the tradition of civilization. Uh, in fact, uh, I for a while had to sit down, not go around, and I just decided to read Steinbeck, uh, who is not, of course, a, of a religious uh, writer. But every book he writes is so deeply informed about what he knows about Christianity. And he could not have written any of what he has written if he did not know his Christianity as well as he knows. But uh, we don't teach our, our children. Uh, nobody is saying that people should start behaving uh, the, uh, the way Valmiki Ramayana uh, asked people to behave. But unless you have read Valmiki Ramayana, you cannot become any kind of scholar of the uh, of a uh, of ideas which is part of his Swaraj. Unless you have read Mahabharata, you what kind of scholar you can become? Uh, and so this uh, this somehow has to be taken much more seriously than we have taken. I was hoping that our new education policy will lay down the path to this, but uh, it makes an effort but doesn't uh, make the jump uh, to we have to, to the direction that we have to take. I think I should be stopping now. So I will just repeat one, that if we want to have a Suraj in ideas, if we are serious about it, we have to make a very large scale effort uh, at beginning to collect data on all aspects of Indian life, just as Dharampalji did in, on some aspects in detail from the archives, from the historical records, but much more than that, from the micro level interaction with the geography, with the geology, history, and people of India. And uh, we have to uh, start uh, uh, trying to create a framework of looking at the world and ourselves and the information we have on the basis of what our classical Indian literature teaches us is the way of, of uh, looking, the way of being. In fact, without having that perception which uh, comes from that kind of knowledge of Indian literature, uh, it will be difficult to. Uh, I think we have the resources today to undertake a very large exercise for the collection of micro-level data that I am talking about. That's not a very difficult exercise. The other exercise is somewhat more difficult, but not impossible. Uh, I think I shall close at this time. Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, thank you, Professor Bajaj. So it's so now open for some discussion. Yes, Mr. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was uh, very inspiring. I just wanted to uh, make two comments. You know, I myself, when I traveled to Ocha, it was an eye opener for me. <laughs> and uh, I still remember sitting quietly outside the chhatri of uh, 
of Maharaja Beer Singh Dev, whom, whom you mentioned just now. It's on the banks of the river Betwa. And uh, you know, one gentleman came. He just looked like an ordinary Indian. And uh, he was wearing kutta pajama. He had a small bag, you know. Just a carry bag hoti hai overnight wali. Bahuti choti si thi. And I was sitting quietly and he took off all his clothes except his kacha. And neatly he had one small towel and he spread that out. And he jumped into the Betwa River and he was in, in there. He uh, did his snan and he came out. After a while, he dried himself. Then we started talking. So he said, Ye to itna bada hai. Um, uh, He says that in the entire region, not just Bundelgand, but the Narmada region, he was. He says, all I do is go to the different Tirthas, I take a dip and I meditate. You know, and he seemed like a perfectly not, you know, just barely able to make a living kind of person. You know, he was not a rich man. But he seems to have put in so much energy in this activity. And of course, he radiated a different kind of wisdom. Now, if you permit me just one little aside, I want to refer to this wonderful book edited by Dr. Jitendra Bajaj called Ayodhya and the Future of India. It's about Dharampalji. And there's a little known essay of Dharampalji. You see, we've read Dharampalji and his beautiful tree, uh, and the uh, science and technology, you know, in the 18th century. But this essay, very few people, I believe, have read. It's called Undamming the Flow. And, uh, you know, I won't go into it in great depth and detail. But uh, let me just read one little thing he says. Dharampalji begins by asking, what sort of society is this? And I don't think we know the answer uh, to, to this question yet. And he answers it in a, in a roundabout way by talking about a entire group of people, you know, who are, who are on this journey that he saw. He was going from Gwalior to Delhi, if I remember right. And in a crowded compartment, all these people came in. And he asked them, who are you? And he said, oh, we are on a pilgrimage. And then he asked some questions like, did you go to Bombay? They said, no. Then they said, uh, then he asked, did you go to Delhi? He said, no. He said, and he was surprised. He said, who are these people? And uh, then he asked, uh, uh, he asked, uh, are you from one? You must be from one caste. He said, no, 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 no. When we are on a pilgrimage, we share food, we sit together. So I am just reminded of this in terms of what you said, Jitendraji, about micro data. See, we don't know our own country. And as you said, you mentioned a scholar from the South. There are many people who don't want to know. They have formed an opinion, Aryan versus Dravidian, this caste versus that caste. And they, they are so invested in this narrative that even the data available, like you talked about epigraphy and inscriptions, we were hoping that Nagaswamiji would join us. But I can tell you there are only 100 people who can read inscriptions in India today properly. See, it's a, such a big crisis that we are facing. So thank you for bringing in this perspective. And I just want to say that Lavanya Ji is a historian. I'm sure that uh, whatever you have said will resonate with historians who want to look more closely at data. And uh, some data is available. It has to be reinterpreted. Other data has to be collected. And you rightly said we have the resources but we do not, we are confused. We do not have the conceptual understanding of what needs to be done. I believe we are still stuck in slogans. A lot of us, even those who are well-intentioned. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, let me let me make a shot. Uh, just uh, since he talked about Orcha, I wanted to just recall, I just recalled, uh, I was sitting also on the banks of Orcha next to the Samadhis. Uh, banks of uh, Betwa, and uh, the kind of person he is describing, uh, that kind of person, one uh, local person, he came to me, he saw me looking at the samadhis carefully, and he kept watching me, then came next to me and asked me, Saab, kya dekh rahe hai? Jo uh, katwa na ho, mein na ho paaye, wo patharwa mein kar dikhaya. 
Do, what cannot be done, what the crafting which cannot be done in wood, they have done in stone. Wow. What are you trying to yeah. <laughs> look wow. at? <laughs> so they know what is good and what is bad. So, tell you. You know those chhatris and you know Datia, Datia, Orcha, the architecture was so splendid that when Shah Jahan came, he said, look, why don't you teach us? I'm a great builder. Why don't you teach me how to do this kind of architecture, seven stories, eight stories, Shilpakari, and so forth. So oh, anyhow, we, we won't Dathya, go into that. Dathya Palace is extraordinary. Anuradhaji wanted to ask something. You're mute. You're mute. Please unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bajaj. Thank you very much, especially about uh, your detail of the Bundaran region. Because what are these scholars is working on that region, the water bodies of that region. So I will definitely oh. reach out to you. But I had a question. How did the British, how were the British able to get such detailed um, information about the entire region? How oh. did they map it with such precision? And whether that is replicable today by us? And the third one is, um, so this is just one. And the other one I wanted to just, uh, I mean, I share what I have read. So in America, when they wanted to introduce positive psychology as uh, another, uh, you know, another school of psychology there, they had a few intellectuals who got together, had a meeting. They then strategized how they would employ uh, professors across the, across the country to take up research in that field and build the entire narrative of positive psychology through publications, through research, through all of that. So I was just wondering if we can do a similar kind of a mapping and identifying what are these core areas that initially need to be identified. Then if we can identify faculty members across the nation and make sure that they are taking research scholars who will be able to do this work for us. And then we can build, we can try to reconstruct the Indian narrative in this manner from an academic perspective. So just love to hear your thoughts on those, please. The, uh, I'll answer the first question that how did the British get all this data? Uh, British were building an empire. And so they knew that you need to have micro level information if you want to build an empire. And uh, it's just uh, sitting in Calcutta or sitting in Delhi, there was nobody, no way to, uh, to, to run India. So they have done very extensive. People have, uh, the, their collectors uh, have walked from village to village, from place to place, and done the, done the uh, cartography. They have done, met people. But of course, they were doing all that from their own perspective. Uh, we have to do, anybody who wants to rebuild India has to undertake the same exercise with the with our own nationalistic perspective. Their data cannot help us in this. And uh, my feeling is doing this today is much easier than what it was their time. One is that uh, communications are much more. And we have much more, technology is much more. We, we can use, I have used in my, my uh, village, uh, Atlases of the uh, of the districts, uh, you can use much more of satellite technology today, and which gives you such a beautiful overview of the of the geography. You know much more of the geology today, and so uh, doing it is not difficult. I have I have done it for ten villages, uh, ten uh, districts. Uh, we could uh, replicate it, uh, but it is a it is a exercise which has to be organized, as you said that if we have done uh, 10 uh, districts, doing 600 districts is the job of the of the state. It has to be organized in a, uh, people like you and me and others can only set an example. But uh, uh, the, uh, ex the, this is an important exercise, this needs to be done. And very many people have been saying, there was the uh, Dharampalji's friend and uh, one of the, Premier political scientist of India, uh, Gopal Krishnji, he repeatedly said to me that why doesn't ICSSR, uh, you make them organize an all India survey 
of what the people of India are thinking. Uh, what, what is so difficult in doing this with all the kind of technologies that we have today, but that kind of exercises have to be undertaken. All our academic system has to be put in the service of creating that data and then doing the narrative. You are very right, the suggestions you are making, but uh, we have to somehow get to doing it rather than just talking about it. We don't have too much time left. Okay, just one small uh, comment, brief comment. Yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, Dr. Bajaj has emphasized the importance of collecting micro level data. Uh, this is the bane of all of our social sciences today. Uh, you take any journal on social science, uh, there are many more opinions than information. There is very little information. There are very few sources looked into, but there is a lot of argument. And uh, an argument of the same type repeats in all articles or one type or the other. And uh, taking data and collecting it and systematically presenting it is not considered an important part of our PhD of our studies, be it in history, in sociology, in every subject. And so th this is the vein of uh, uh, that we don't want to understand our situation, contemporary situation in depth. Uh, this, uh, I think, is a very major point. That Yes, me. Uh, uh, Rajvirji wanted to say something. Yeah, Rajvirji wanted to say something. Uh, Rajvirji, you are muted. Sir, first of all, uh, let me compliment Professor Bajaj. You know, he has been a, a researcher who has put his blood and sweat in ground level and the micro level uh, research and collection of data and analysis. And today also he has emphasized that there's a Swaraj in research. Perhaps we will not be able to change the narratives, what we believe in. And particularly when the false narratives are going on and false narratives are, are spreading uh, across uh, the, the country, we will have to create a data which can not only counter the false narratives, but also can help us in presenting our own narrative. Uh, the second thing which I want to say is that the universities shall have to reorient themselves insofar as research is concerned. Generation of data, creation of data, analysis of data. This is possible if the universities, in fact, focus on this kind of research and particularly in the fields of social sciences there's ample scope for collection of such kind of uh, data. So therefore, uh, I think there's a need, uh, even at the level of the, uh, the Ministry of Education, to at least uh, uh, to, to uh, ask the universities to engage themselves in this kind of research. Okay, thank you. So uh, Dr. Lavanya has been waiting no, Makarand wants to say something, uh, Makarand wants to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makaranji, huh? you are muted. Not able to hear you. Thank you so much. I want to take Lavanyaji's permission to say one or two things. Uh, if you don't mind, because you see, this subject is so important. And I want to revert to the question that uh, Anuradhaji asked which is how did the British do it? And why can't we do it? I think this is a profound question and it has two aspects. See, we haven't understood the nature of British colonialism. How did they, a small island, how did they build an empire across the continents, dealing with different cultures, different religions, different nations, different nationalities, different civilizations, they must have done something right, however evil, wicked, exploitative, cruel they were. Now, if you look at India itself, somebody mentioned William Jones in the morning. Uh, Professor Tripathi mentioned William Jones. You know, there's a wonderful painting of William Jones and Rutunjaya Vidyalankar. Of course, there were native informants. Of course, Everest never went to Everest. Of course, Radhanath Sikdar of the Trigonometric Survey did it. Of course, Cunningham had Indian assistance. 
but to think that they stole everything is very childish you know an average ics officer his salary was so huge his servants he had 40 servants but his means were so high that if he was inclined or she they could hire so many indians to work for them so they created a system i just mention about one such person alan octavian hume they were all about bundelkhand let's not forget he was the collector of jhansi during the great revolt and uh, he helped to put down the revolt in fact but he was an extraordinary man he was a theosophist for some time and there's a connection with shimla he had a home here with rothney castle it's still here but the thing i want to say about this man he founded the indian national congress it had a different name he encouraged indians to stand up for themselves and he fell out of favor with the british lord dufferin was on friendly terms with him who founded who started this vice regal court completed it rather and then he got demoted you see these british authorities felt this fellow is a troublemaker
Okay, I'll just finish in one moment. I was talking about Alan Octavian Hume, and I mentioned how he got demoted because the British didn't like him. But in his home in Shimla, Rothney Castle, he collected 80,000 species of birds and their eggs. And later on, uh, when he found that these were uh, uh, endangered, he requested the British Museum, which then became, got bifurcated and became the British Museum of Natural History, to send an expert to evaluate his collection and uh, ship it back to London. And all of this actually happened. If you go to the Museum of Natural History in London, the biggest single donor was Alan Octavian Hume. And the story doesn't end there. He turned vegetarian. And then he said, instead of collecting birds, some of whom he had to kill, he stopped doing it and he started collecting plants. And his, so all I'm trying to say in response to what Anuradhaji said is that British colonialism, the British empire was a mighty thing. It was as much an empire of ideas as it was of territory and uh, uh, of, of, of military prowess. And the saving grace, the saving grace is that Indian nationalism was also a mighty thing, you know, as Gopal Krishnaji used to tell me. And the kind of people we produced, uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose was mentioned, PC Roy, you know, in every field, C.V. Raman, Rabindranath Tagore, Gandhi, Raman Maharishi. I mean, you see what's happened to us after independence. Yesterday, Madhav Hada Saab said something very interesting. Hum pangu ban chuke hai. It is a dwarfism. This is an intellectual dwarfism that has crippled us uh, after independent, after independent, uh, after, in independent India, after independence. And particularly, I would say, in the last three, four decades. So for us, people like uh, Dr. Bajaj, and uh, you know, some of these people are passing away, I'm afraid. Sundarlal Pahogunaji passed away. So many, uh, Gopal Krishnaji, whom I knew deeply, he passed away. And uh, it was he who explained Ayodhya to me, you see, in, uh, when, the, when the masjid was uh, felled. Uh, anyhow, so I'm saying these people are passing away. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, there's no continuity between the generation uh, that grew up after independence. Uh, Dharampalji passed away too. So uh, these are just some thoughts. And I know we have, uh, we have cut into Lavanyaji's time. But uh, for concluding remarks, please make them, uh, whether, uh, you know, Shipaji wants to make them, Jitendraji wants to make them, uh, and then we'll move on. Or MD Srinivasji wants to make them. If others have anything to uh, conclude, uh, they can make the remarks. Otherwise, I will introduce. Uh, Shilipa, give me just one minute. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Use Dorcha so much. Uh, I just want to recount one more incident that happened there with me. I was uh, sitting in the Raja, Ram Raja temple of Orcha uh, and uh, this was the evening time and uh, uh, there were a large number of women sitting there and singing in a very lilting voice about uh, Ram. I think, I believe it's from Ram Charit Manas that they were sitting. There was a colleague of mine next to me and I asked him, that I am wondering whether they have learned from Tulsidas or Tulsidas learned from them. Really, you cannot make out. And all probability it was Tulsidas, uh, who was actually connected to the Orcha in a senior, serious manner at Islamic Mythology, who would have learned from their way of uh, thinking of Ramachandra. And this was only to pay my respects to the Orcha people. Namaste. Okay, so. Um, then we move on to the last session by uh, Dr. Lavanya, and she has all the time. The advantage is nobody will stop her. At least I will not. And uh, we can have a discussion on that because her uh, talk is also very interesting. Foundations of Indian Civilization, Prehistoric and Genetic Evidence. So here also, I think uh, we will talk a lot about uh, data.
um, Lavanya ji has a PhD in religious studies as well as in history. So uh, let's see what she has to say, Dr. Lavanya. Uh, namaste, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Sripad Karmalkar, for uh, the sweet introduction. Um, I thank uh, Professor Makran Pranjpe and uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies for inviting me uh, to present today. Uh, I also thank Dr. Bajaj uh, for starting us on uh, a new understanding of Indian history. Uh, Indian history, uh, each of the chapters are confused. Uh, each of the sections are um, confused, but more than uh, any of the chapters, the, the most confused chapter uh, is the foundations. Um, in the world, uh, no other history begins with invasions, uh, that to mythical invasions. The Indo-European uh, language theory, the linguistic theory, um, is supposed to have uh, happened. Uh, the languages have spread probably to, to India and to Europe, but the effects of invasions and the mythical invasion theories only affect Indian history. Uh, this type of beginnings are not found in any other history in the world. Uh, for example, Indian history begins with the uh, Aryan invasions and then Indian history. Uh, but uh, no European history begins with the uh, Indo European language uh, and uh, then history, German history or uh, Greek history or any other history. What does this, this show us? Um, what does this tell us uh, about the thought process and about the data and the, the interpretation of data that is available? Of course, the language uh, linguistic theories are proposed, but why does this affect only India and no other countries? The Indo-European language uh, spread to many other countries, but why doesn't this happen to any other countries? Uh, why doesn't the theories of invasion take over histories of these other nations? The other nations' histories begin uh, with the foundations and with the origins, na na natural origins, without uh, much change. So why, why is this happening only in India? This happens most of the time uh, in, in nations that are occupied, that are colonized. So our historical writing, as well as the historical beginnings, uh, are colonized. The data itself is colonized to reinterpret and mythologize the history that we already know. So in this paper, in today's paper, I will focus on three things. What we have uh, as, as a theory of beginnings, uh, the Aryans and the myths, and then what is the evidence? What is the real evidence we have? Uh, the Pleistocene uh, settlements and prehistoric beginnings as well as genetic beginnings. And then I will conclude. The third part is about the conclusion and then what we can uh, understand from the data that we have. Uh, how this data was ignored for a long time uh, so that the mythical theories could uh, still be taught, still be part of uh, Indian history. I'm, I'm opening my notes, so I will go on with the, with the presentation as soon as I open my notes. Can't hear you, Lavanya ji. Okay, I'm. I'm. Can't just... hear you. Please. 
She's opening her notes, I think. Yeah. I'm opening my notes and then uh, I will go on. Oh, the, the notes is still sorry, opening. Sorry. Okay. The, the eternal question uh, is, uh, where do we come from and whence do we go? Uh, this has plagued humanity constantly. Even though cosmological and theological perspectives have speculated long on this question, it is only recently that more information has become available to understand the historical journey of humanity on this earth. However, in India's case, the available prehistoric evidence, as well as the available early historic evidence and textual evidence was ignored to create a mythical theory. Uh, this is because the history is not written uh, by the, the history is not written by uh, people living there, but the history is living, uh, written from the colonial perspective. The colonialists, the imperialists, have began writing history for India. The, the history hasn't come from India, but the history has come from outside. Um, so in the, in the case of beginnings, even though India has the oldest origins, the origins are uh, given to uh, invasions. So what we have as the theories of origins is um, Aryan invasions and then um, then their settlements and then how they occupied and uh, developed India. So there is millions of years of um, history before that, prior to that. And is this known to the Britishers? Yes. Uh, they actually found the early prehistoric tools and implements. And um, as Professor Makran Pranjpe has already noted, uh, the Natural History Museum and the uh, other museums have uh, many of these tool assemblages, the hand axes and all this, and also the um, uh, early bone assemblages that were also found. A uh, number of uh, pithy scenes, you know, the Paleolithic tools and Paleolithic uh, bone assemblages were also in uh, many of the museums. So, so this this information is known. Uh, it is known that India had uh, one of the earliest civilizations on the earth. But the colonial government, the imperial government, is faced with a with the challenge that uh, they have to discount whatever is available within India, whatever prehistoric data is available, whatever narrative textual data is available, that has to be discounted in order that they can create a new history which can control. Uh, the population of India, the large population of India, which is also literate, which is also uh, somewhat uh, clear about their origins, somewhat uh, understanding of their origins. So uh, this gives a major task. This is one of the tasks the imperial government uh, has established. Uh, the writing the colonial histories has been uh, the greatest uh, imperialist project. Lots, lots had been written. This is not a small project. Um, many were involved. And the strange thing is many of them have not even uh, visited India. Many of these early sociologists that developed um, the caste theory and sociological theories haven't visited India. And the linguists who developed this theory of Aryan invasion and the race uh, theory of uh, some race being called Aryan have also not visited India. So this actually comes from uh, data uh, and a lot of uh, imagination and uh, an agenda to, to discount whatever is available in India uh, by, uh, and to come up with a new theoretical beginnings for India so that the, the population, their theories, their understanding could be changed uh, and could be controlled and governed easily. Um, this happened in all colonial nations. Uh, that is the reason uh, most of the colonial nations still struggle uh, to find their history. Uh, decolonization of history is one of the major, major 
uh, concerns of many of the independent nations um, that became independent from 1950 onwards uh, across Asia and across uh, Africa. Uh, even though uh, we already talked about it, uh, even though Indo-European language theory is found uh, across the world, it doesn't affect the history of any other nation. It affects only the history of uh, occupied nations. African nations have this theory of, you know, races coming from the north and occupying. And uh, Asia has this theory of uh, races coming from north and occupying and uh, replacing uh, native populations. Even though there is no evidence, no evidence to prove that any uh, large racial migrations ever happened uh, during those times. And recent uh, research has also shown, uh, genetic research, uh, initially they thought that uh, supports the Aryan migration theory, but recent genetic research also uh, showed that there is nothing like that because there is no large uh, civilization in the steppes to send a large number of people uh, to invade India or invade uh, any other larger civilizations anywhere in the world. Um, so whatever theories that were proposed in the 1950s are merely based on conjectures. They are not really based on data. So uh, I, now I will move on to the second part uh, of my presentation about what is the evidence? What do we have um, in, the, in, the, in the name of evidence? For example, the Pleistocene settlements, the prehistoric beginnings, as well as the genetic uh, history. Uh, India is uh, central to peopling and foundation of human settlements across Asia. Thinking about human migrations and early settlements in India helps understand the whole of Indian subcontinent before the invention of writing. Understanding these beginnings helps us remind us the central role India has played in the spread of human beings, crops and animals and non-African world. It is very important for uh, India uh, to know what are the beginnings. Uh, in order to come out of this colonial uh, control and imperialist mind control uh, that has been put in place uh, for, for the last uh, 200 years, it's important that uh, in new history of India begin uh, with the actual beginnings of uh, Indian history. So during the last uh, Pleistocene era, between uh, 5 million years to 1.3 million years ago, we have uh, prehistoric human settlements in India. Um, the first human settlements, the Paleolithic settlements, uh, are known as archaic human beings, uh, also known as Homo sapiens, uh, commonly known as hominids, uh, found across India. These are called by a number of uh, names, uh, Pithi signs, you know, Shiva Pithikas, Rama Pithikas, and um, all these different names, um, and. By the Middle Paleolithic, uh, we have the foundations of modern, uh, probably the replacement may have happened in the Upper Paleolithic. Uh, the modern humans, anatomically modern hum humans, uh, begin uh, appearing from the Upper Paleolithic levels, and they are more commonly found in uh, Mesolithic levels. Uh, and this is the time we also find uh, more occupations, more artistic creations, more settlements across India. This is not just confined to one uh, small area, but it is found all across India. So this, this shows us Middle Paleolithic tools are more abundant widespread throughout the region of South, uh, South Asia, uh, which is Indian uh, subcontinent. Uh, earliest art and artifacts of India are also dated abundantly from Himalayan foothills and the peninsular region of India. So noteworthy among them uh, is Bimbetka Caves of Central India, which actually shows Upper Paleolithic as well as Mesolithic uh, habitations as well as paintings, uh, which is one of the most important uh, continuously occupied sites of India. So, so the so the point is, from Upper Paleolithic onwards, uh, India shows continuous occupation, continuous 
uh, tool assemblages and bone assemblages from around uh, across India, uh, all of the Indian subcontinent, from all the way from northwestern India, Himalayan foothills to the uh, peninsular India. Uh, in fact, the earliest uh, stone assemblages are found uh, in the north as well as in the south, uh, the southern tip, Athirampakam, and uh, all these places. So, uh, so for for us who are dealing with this early beginnings and early settlements of India, uh, the questions that uh, that that come up are, who are the first people of India? Were they replaced by subsequent population migrations? Was there tangible evidence to support the theory of population replacement about 4,000 to 3,500 years ago, uh, which is placed uh, about Aryan migration 2000 BC uh, to 19, 1500 BC, as postulate, postulated by the Aryan migration invasion theories? Uh, are the present day Indians descendants of the original prehistoric settlers of India? Are, are they replaced by these uh, invade, invaders, supposed invaders? So for these questions, the history is very clear. The history source shows continuous occupation from Paleolithic onwards. Upper Paleolithic uh, shows anatomically modern human tool assemblages and bone assemblages. And by Mesolithic, this is very commonly found all across India. And by Neolithic period, we have two uh, settled agricultural civilizations that can be found in India. Uh, Southern Peninsula, of course, has independent origin of agriculture. Northwestern India also has independent agriculture. The theory of somebody coming and introducing agriculture, horses and iron, uh, is not supported by the data we found on the ground. Iron tools and iron implements are actually found datable to 1100 to 1400 BC in India. Uh, iron smelting is found in Neolithic sites uh, in, in, in India. And Neolithic is actually spread uh, throughout the subcontinent. Uh, and uh, uh, first early village settlements and agriculture is found in southern India as well as northwestern India. Mehergar is, of course, familiar to most of you. So the Neolithic shows somewhat uh, differences in uh, evolution. The Northern Neolithic is uh, mixed with Chocolithic. Southern Neolithic, of course, is mixed with uh, Megalithic. Uh, and Eastern Neolithic is somewhat different. So there are differences within the Neolithic civilizations on how they are spread across and how they evolved different uh, features, regional features. However, what is the important point is uh, the population is spread throughout India and Neolithic civilization is spread throughout India and they have cultural contacts and internal uh, cultural contacts and uh, intermixture, uh, which can be seen from pottery fragments that uh, are associated with uh, one culture are also found commonly in another culture. So, for example, Southern Neolithic has uh, pottery fragments from other uh, Neolithic cultures. And similarly, other Neolithic cultures also showed some cultural assemb assemblages from different cultural uh, regions. Uh, and uh, uh, so this shows there is really no uh, cultural replacement. Uh, from Paleolithic onwards, upper Paleolithic onwards, there is a continuity of settlement. As the population increased, the settlements increased. And the culture evolved. Uh, there is Mesolithic, there is Neolithic, and Megalithic. Uh, and uh, uh, my friends who, who are working on uh, many of these uh, regional uh, sites, Megalithic sites, Neolithic sites, they tell me, even though the cultural assemblages are a little bit different. For example, Megalithic sites and uh, Neolithic sites, a little bit of different cultural assemblages, but they existed side by side. So the, the idea was different human groups that are living within uh, India between Paleolithic to Neolithic period evolved uh, based on whatever regional resources that are available to them and developed the technologies, developed the agriculture, developed their cultural uh, uh, civilizational processes 
as they evolved within that region. And another important thing is, as these cultures developed, they also shared, they did not replace our, uh, there is also no evidence of large wars between these different uh, cultural groups. For example, we already talked about Neolithic and megalithic cultures existing side by side. They're actually mutually uh, beneficial to each other. They exchanged goods rather than they went to wars with each other. No large knives, no large uh, weapons, uh, no la large war uh, type of replacements are found in, in any of the uh, historical, prehistoric sites um uh, for now in the indian subcontinent so so the so the so the idea that comes out of the data on the ground is that there is continuous evolution from paleolithic the evolution might be different in different regions the neolithic might be a little bit different the paleolithic might be different the chocolithic might be a little bit different but all these cultures cooperated and traded with each other and existed in a mutually beneficial relationships and not really go to wars which means which means that india is a resource rich uh, land that uh, the human groups that are uh, settled here had found a way to cooperate with each other rather than replace each other so the replacement concept itself uh, is not is alien to India. The replacement and large scale wars and uh, destroying uh, another civilization completely to take over is not part of Indian culture, not part of Indian history uh, as the data we see. So uh, this is what we have uh, in uh, in the ground, right? This is the evidence we have, prehistoric evidence, civilizational coexistence prehistorical coexistence. And at the same time, what do we have uh, in case of genetic evidence? The genetic evidence also uh, matches what we have uh, in the ground. The prehistoric evidence and the genetic evidence um, also shows continuity. The genetic evidence that we have, the current people of India actually hold genetic evidence that traces itself back to 74,000 years ago. Uh, and the question is, why is it between 74,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, if the land is occupied uh, since five to seven uh, million, million years ago? Uh, th uh, there is this question uh, raised by geographer, geographical research and archeologists also, uh, and it was, uh, thought that the Toba volcanic eruption uh, probably might have destroyed uh, many of the early historic sites so that uh, the, the newer uh, cultures evolved from 74,000 years ago uh, onwards. So, so whatever population that we have, uh, uh, the origins, the genetic origins trace back to 74,000 years ago, which dates to Mesolithic. Uh, of course, you know, the anatomically modern humans uh, are found from upper Paleolithic period onwards, but the genetic heritage traces back from uh, Mesolithic period onwards. So, so, so the point is we have prehistoric evidence, continuous prehistoric evidence, continuous origins. And from Mesolithic onwards, we also have these continuous origins that are traced in uh, genetic uh, evidence. So what this shows us is <laughs> the, the, the human beings, the anatomically modern human beings who had settled in India uh, during the Upper Paleolithic period uh, may have faced this cataclysmic event, the Toba volcanic event. However, fortunately they survived uh, and their genetic heritage also survived uh, within the current populations that are living in India. Uh, most of the DNA of the modern Indians, female uh, traces to 80,000 to 74,000 years ago, and male genetic uh, evidence traces to uh, about 70,000 years ago. So, 
uh, comparable, uh, comparable that, you know, uh, even though there was a cataclysmic event, the anatomically modern humans survived. Uh, and from Mesolithic age onwards, they multiplied and spread across the subcontinent. Uh, that is the reason we see uh, similar genetic heritage across the subcontinent. Uh, and the genetic heritage the, uh, seems much more uh, closer uh, to, the, to the populations across India, which, which shows... Um, which shows that uh, the, the population is spread uh, gradually across India, not that uh, they went from north to south or south to north. Um, uh, this kind of spread or replacement is not supported in the tools. They are not supported in the genetic heritage also. The male genetic heritage as well as female genetic heritage. Um, I would not like to go into genetic heritage details here because I have already uh, spoken about it and uh, my paper also discusses the details about it. So um, uh, it's found all across India and it's also found spread across all castes and uh, all tribals and everything. The genetics do not show a difference between uh, the so-called Aryan groups and non-Aryan groups. There is there is nothing like that. So so this shows the continued heritage and also the continued spread of anatomically modern humans uh, who were habit who were living in India from uh, five million million years ago. It was only a continuity. There was a cataclysmic event, uh, but uh, it has not replaced. It has not changed uh, much for India. So, uh, so what can we uh, think of this as contributing to India and Indian history? Does this have anything to do with the uh, Aryan migration? Uh, do we have the prehistoric cultural um, practices still uh, being practiced among our population in some areas, right? The answer is yes. Uh, several upper Paleolithic tools, uh, such as board stones and grinding slabs are still used by tribal groups and uh, village uh, population for processing grains. Um, you may have also seen that. Um, and the uh, uh, goddesses temples uh, also uh, show a similarity um, from some sides. Uh, some of you may have also studied about this um, uh, Bagor two site. We, we, we have all been discussing uh, Central India and Bundelkhand and uh, uh, Soan Valley recently. Uh, so Bagor II uh, actually gave uh, one of the earliest Mesolithic settlements and one of the earliest Mesolithic um, goddess temples. Um, the temple, uh, as as very similar to the modern temples, it's um, it's it's a, a stone um, uh, which is also surrounded by concentric circles. So. Uh, it is worshipped, and uh, we we see similar stone structures and platforms uh, still worshipped uh, across India as uh, goddesses. Uh, in Andhra Pradesh, there are many many old temples uh, called Bodurai or Bodrai, found in the center of villages, uh, worshipped as goddess. Um, uh, this is found uh, by different names in uh, different places, but uh, finding this uh, triangular or round uh, stones uh, worshipped as goddess in uh, uh, by regional names is very common uh, across India, uh, and it uh, it is one of the traditions that is also found in uh, Mesolithic uh, cultural assemblages. What does this tell us? Right, it tells us there is population continuity because the genetic continuity is noted from Mesolithic age onwards, and cultural uh, continuity is also noted because of these practices of these worshiping goddesses and many of the tool assemblages that are very similar to Mesolithic age are still used. And there are no weapons and no replacement. So this, this only tells us there is cultural evolution and sharing and interactions. Uh, when there are um, 
cultures which actually are on a resource crunch uh, go on a rampage and replace each other because the, they have to fight for uh, resources. In resource-rich uh, continents, for example, Africa and uh, Indian subcontinent, resources are rich. So each tribe, each group has its own uh, resources to develop and share. So mutually cooperating, mutually beneficial civilizations uh, developed and coexisted. That's the reason each region developed in its own way. Each region uh, developed agriculture in its own way. Each region also uh, uh, evolved its own agriculture and its own uh, tool assemblages, which doesn't mean that they did not cooperate. They cooperated, which we can understand from uh, the sharing of pottery and sharing of art assemblages that we can uh, find in the different places. So uh, how can we uh, understand the culture? Uh, how can we uh, see that uh, one of the cultures, one of the tool assemblages become much more prevalent, uh, are much more uh, popular. Um, some of them continue and some of them don't continue. How can we understand this? So we can actually understand this as civil civilizational shifts. The civilization shifts from one phase to the other phase in its natural course of development. Uh, for example, if we are seeing in the modern age, uh, the modern societies have adapted technology uh, anywhere they are. Um, the computers and all these technologies adapted very uh, similarly and spread. Similarly, uh, ancient societies adapted technology that they found more useful. Uh, for example, the pottery, some of the pottery is good and uh, nice which becomes more popular and more adapted uh, everywhere else. Um, and tools also more, more adaptable, more uh, acceptable everywhere else. So whatever is easier, whatever is convenient, uh, gets used more uh, and remains uh, part of continuous uh, civilization. At the same time, it is not a replacement because it is also continuing some of the oldest traditions that are there, like this goddess worship and all these things. So even though they adapted some of the technological progress, some of the pottery, some of the agricultural, some of the language, uh, these things uh, become more popular and common across the, across the nation, they also remain their own um, development and their own uh, simplistic uh, evolution. So uh, as a conclusion, what I want to say is uh, India's sources India's sources of uh, history uh, are hidden uh, in the people and its land. We have to understand its people and its uh, uh, understand the evidence data uh, that is hidden uh, under the ground. We haven't used it yet, but we should begin using it. We should begin using uh, the genetic evidence. We should begin using the archeological evidence that we have. Uh, as Professor Bajaj has pointed out in his presentation, we should also begin using the inscriptional data. The society evolved uh, in the way that it evolved. The society actually went through constrictions uh, from 1200 CE onwards. However, the society prior to 1200 CE is not what uh, it went through later. So the the society the ancient india the foundations that we see are much more different much more independently evolved uh, much more grounded uh, within indian civilization um, uh, the the replacement is not a concept that is um, supported in the evidence we have in the genetic evidence as well as in the prehistoric evidence we have uh, there are continuous occupations and continuous genetic evolution from Mesolithic uh, period onwards. Um, so the replacement is not uh, supported in our history. Um, what is supported in our history is continuous evolution of Indian civilization and continuous occupation and also uh, continuity within cultural assemblages and cultural practices. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Lavanyaji. Uh, so it's open for discussion and question answers. 
So two hands going up. Uh, I will uh, let um, Makaran Paranspeji uh, start and then after that, uh, Professor Raju. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lavanya ji. That was absolutely spot on and brilliant. You know, this idea that uh, India in its entire history demonstrates coexistence, not replacement. This is evident in, uh, you know, not just the human settlements, but flora and fauna also to a great extent. If you go to Europe, all the original wildlife has been completely destroyed. Even in China, uh, only certain parts of China have uh, the wildlife that persisted, uh, say, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. In fact, when I went to Beijing, I didn't find a single crow, which I found very surprising. Because in India, you have crows everywhere. And uh, uh, I then found out, and they said, oh, they're all, I don't want to say what they did to them, you can imagine. Because they did go through some difficult times. Uh, and the great leap forward and so forth. So what I'm saying is, if you look around, uh, the so-called uh, older populations of India, whose genetic history can be traced right down to the same migrations which uh, we shared with the Australian indigenous people 40,000 years back, maybe 60,000 years back. The point I'm making is those populations still persist in India. And even if you look at the census, the so-called uh, ST populations, well, seven and a half percent is, you know, more than 100, 120 million people, you know, which is the size of many nations in the world. So what we see in other parts, where are the Caribs? There are no Caribs, there are the Caribbean islands, but where are the Caribs? The Caribs are gone. The Aborigines are practically reduced to a few thousand, the Native Americans are to, to a few thousand. But, you know, in India, all kinds of populations have coexisted. And this is linked to what Anuradha ji was asking earlier. You know, K.S. Singh, I don't know if you remember this person, you know, uh, Kumar Suresh Singh. He was an IAS officer, a PhD, who became the commissioner of Chota Nagpur and then the People of India survey of the anthropologic, uh, anthropological um, survey of India. So the work of Risley and all these other people earlier, Grass and Linguistic Survey. You know, if you look at his work, it's an extraordinary, again, he's no more. I'm saying it's an extraordinary mapping of the people of India, which proves, in a sense, through cultural and so-called anthropological data, what you have been saying through genetic and historical information. The coexistence of people, not the replacement of people, the interdependence, the persistence of so-called Stone Age tools, including, you know, the mortar and the grinding stone. How do you make idli? Even today you're doing it in some form or the other of the same old grinding stone. So I think this has a, a profound importance and significance for how we study our uh, history. The only question I had was one thing I didn't catch from your uh, uh, presentation. Of course, the data or the evidence that does not support invasions. I mean, I've talked to uh, Professor Bibi Lal, who is not only the DG of the uh, uh, you know Archaeological Survey of India, but also long served directors of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. And at one time, the two were almost conjoined because when he became director of IS, they moved the ASI to Shimla because his work was so valuable. Anyhow, that's a different story. And he says, look, there is no inv invasion evidence. There's no genocidal evidence. There are no bones. There are no, uh, you know, dead bodies uh, which bear wounds, forts are not stormed and so forth. He, he has documented it all. But my question has to do with migration. Doesn't the genetic evidence also support large scale migration, both into India and out of India? By large scale, I mean, let me put my timeline, 10,000 years, 6,000, 7,000, 4,000, 3,000. 
I mean, is it, there's an out of Africa theory, of course, and uh, uh, and uh, the, the, I can't remember his name. The Greek, uh, 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 who? No, no, the 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 historian, uh, and you know, I was in this debate with uh, 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 you know with uh, Witzel and all that. So the the philological evidence versus the archaeological evidence. This is a very big issue. Now, my point is that isn't there evidence to show migration? Migration that still, uh, I mean, also out of India. For example, the Assyrians, you know, uh, they had a language like Sanskrit. They were linked to us, the Georgians, you know, even today, words like the Danube. So philological evidence is of value. And that, see, even the Parsis migrated. So, see, my point is large-scale invasions happened in recent times, uh, you know, 600 in the current era, a little bit earlier, uh, you know, the scattering of the Jewish tribes and so forth. So, I think invasions happened, people were scattered. My own community apparently was scattered after the Islamic invasion of the, those periods, the old uh, Sassanid empires. Look at Aleppo, you know. The Syrian Christian church traces its origin. Those were Christian areas. You see, they were all scattered. So, from older times, prehistoric times, to 7,000, 8,000, 4,000, 3,000, some kind of migration back and forth seems to be there. And, uh, of course, later on, invasions also happened. We know that in historical times. There were so many invasions. Uh, you know, the Turkic, the, the Mamluks uh, ruled us from, from uh, Egypt, they came to Delhi. So there was a lot of movement back and forth. So my question is, where do you factor in the migrations? Because lastly, even food, which you didn't mention, you see from China to, uh, to Istanbul, there's a food chain, you know, of how noodles travel, rice travels, Jalebi, pulav, kebabs, naans, all kinds of things. Khichdi, khichdi is everywhere. You you know, the, so things travel. Uh, so that was my question. What about migrations? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's very interesting question, uh, and this is very commonly raised. Uh, that's the reason I mentioned right at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, how data is interpreted and how history is written for nations uh, is also an imperialist project. Uh, of course, every nation uh, has this. Uh, there are small scale migrations. Uh, and of course, every nation has this linguistic theory. Uh, Greek, German, all these have also uh, Indo European languages entering their nations. But that doesn't take over their whole history. The so begins with prehistoric beginnings with its roots. My argument here is also very similar. Indian history should begin where it should begin. It should begin with its prehistoric settlements. It should begin with early human populations, how Indian history uh, spread. Uh, of course, there are uh, settlements and migrations and occupations. Uh, there are people going from one place to the other place replacements. But we don't find that in the beginnings of history. Uh, the Mesolithic beginnings continued to run smoothly for a, for a long period of time. That's the reason the cultural uh, practices had time to settle and time to uh, spread the languages and uh, the cultural practices. For example, the goddess worship I shared with you. Um, it is found in one uh, prehistoric site, but it is found across India. So the cultural practices, the uh, civilizational practices have a long time to spread, long time to settle, long time to uh, form uh, their own uh, practices in India. So what does the genetic evidence tell us? Of course, prehistoric evidence shows us continuity and continue, continuous sharing and news evolution and some ideas persisting, some ideas, of course, uh, did not continue. Uh, 
uh, it always happens in every civilization. Uh, when we start using a new uh, equipment, we begin discarding the older equipment. So it happens with some, it doesn't happen with all. So the cultural continuity, cultural evolution, of course, noticed in um, historical um, evidence. Um, no invasions, no replacements are noticed. At the same time, what does the genetics tell us? The genetics shows us the original inhabitants of India, the anatomically modern humans that were found 74,000 years ago. Of course, they were found uh, from five, uh, from upper Paleolithic, uh, from um, 1.5 million, million years ago. However, uh, after replacement, after the Toba volcanic eruption from 74,000 years ago, you have this new population surviving in India and then continuing. So um, this continuity, you would find within male populations and within female populations also. There were some theories. Some of them uh, said, oh, yeah, this supports uh, Aryan invasion. But newer research, newer genetic research has showed uh, that such replacements have not uh, seen. So on the ground, we don't have weapons. We don't have replacements. We don't have uh, some Neolithic uh, sites replaced by other Neolithic sites. For example, if somebody is coming during Neolithic age and replacing, there should be evidence on the ground. There should be weapons. There should be forceful occupation within the sites. The Neolithic sites are excavated ex across India. We have Northern Neolithic, Eastern Neolithic, Southern Neolithic. Uh, of course, uh, you're all historians. You have all known that. And um, Bibi Lal has done pioneering work on this. He's an inspiration to all of us. Uh, we don't find any large replacements or any large weapons or any large killings. If if there is a full replacement of population, lots of people might should have been killed and should have been dumped in one place. So we don't have any bone assemblages like that. So so the so the so the evidence doesn't show it. Genetic evidence doesn't show it. Genetic evidence shows continuity of uh, genetic heritage among female as well as male. Uh, what it shows is the, the male and female genetic heritage, the CDF. I actually have a paper on this one. Um, so from there, uh, different clades have originated. They have spread to southeastern India, and uh, southeast, uh, so southern islands, southeast Asia, and the islands, the Pacific islands. And then they also spread uh, to Australia. So the populations of... Uh, I think so, we, we lost. Uh, uh, you're back. For a, uh, you can, okay. Yeah, for about half a minute, yeah. 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 So, so what I was saying is the genetic evidence shows uh, that the founders, the, the anatomically modern humans, the AMA Foundation, the founders are in India. And India is actually, the Indian subcontinent is actually called the founder's zone for the genetic heritage. So the from the founder's zone, uh, of course there is evolutions and then the clades, different clades spread to different uh, regions. So this actually shows that uh, genetic evidence is continued and then um, India is actually at the at a crucial juncture. Uh, and 60% of Indian population, current population actually has this uh, genetic heritage that was originally there. So. Uh, so it is more of continuity uh, rather than um, replacement. And another point is uh, we should come out of this uh, imperialist history. So no nation uh, writes its history beginning with invasions. Uh, even though uh, linguistic theories uh, are equally found in all these nations, of course, in um, Indo-European language is found in uh, all European nations, but uh, their history doesn't begin with, you know, uh, uh, coming of Indo-Europeans and then our history it doesn't begin like that. So uh, having this theory and meaning our history uh, through some linguistic theory. We actually got our um, origins confused. 
uh, because of this theory. Um, it, it, it doesn't, uh, ha it has no place uh, in Indian history. Professor Raju. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Now, I didn't see you really engaging with the Aryan race theory. You're talking about Paleolithic, Neolithic, that's very far back. You're really talking about uh, some very recent events which are not characterizing geological time periods. All right, so, and we are too did not engage with the linguistic evidence. So, I don't believe in the Aryan race thesis, by the way, right? I am writing against it and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, I still want to see what you said in relation to, because I was hoping to pick something about the Aryan race thesis. Now, let me say I discount the genetic evidence altogether. It is complete fraud. As a statistician, I can tell you, give me any data and I will give you any kind of ling uh, linguistic, uh, uh, any kind of genetic lineage that you like. All right. Because uh, it's such a vast amount of data and you want to build in some correlations like this and so on, it is worthless, in my opinion. But the linguistic opinion, uh, the linguistic lineage is relevant. Uh, so, you have a situation, how do you really account for the similarities of these languages? And I think that if you're looking at India, you can't look at just India alone, look at Iran. You can't discount Iran. So if you look at Iran now, suddenly you find cultural changes, uh, which are very strong, but also changes. And you do find, uh, I'm not saying that there was an Aryan race invasion, there could be many other explanations. But I didn't see you engage with that linguistic point of view. And I don't want to hear the story of this continuity of genetic linkages. I'm not looking at that. And the, uh, uh, the uh, geological evidence that you're citing, that is not relevant to this immediate issue of our investment. So I am looking very critically for evidence which has a bearing on what William Jones said. And I don't think he was engaged in a colonial plot. He may have been a judge and so on and so forth, but if you read his article, he is not uh, plotting uh, the suppression of Indians with that history. Other people may have done that later on, but he is not doing that. So you need to engage with that particular evidence which you have And another question of Medica, I'll come back. Do you see it as megalithic? So, first question. So first question is about the Aryan languages? Yes. Yes, okay. All right. um, I spoke about this a little bit, uh, and I will talk about this again. Language is not race. And linguistic theory, uh, the linguistics hasn't happened only to India. It happened to other nations also. The Indo-European languages spread uh, into Europe, into Germany, into Greece into a, many nations, as you already mentioned. How, do, they how have, do they have their history taken over by this linguistic theory? Agreed. Do they have Agreed. history beginning with, no, beginning with Indo European the tribes and then German history, Indo European tribes and then uh, no. Greek what history? What is your explanation for that spread? What is your explanation for those uh, striking uh, similarities in language? Okay, I'm, I'm speaking. can I talk on this a little yeah. bit? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ra Professor Raji, for your question. Uh, and I enjoyed this question. This question is not new for me. Uh, I have uh, answered this question uh, at every conference I presented about Aryans. They always bring this linguistic theory. And my answer is always the same. Uh, the two points. The first point is language is not race. And language has spread to many other countries. Their history is not wrecked by this language spread. Why is it happening to India? It is happening to India because India is an occupied nation. We never had a chance to write our history. If we write our history, it will only form a sideline. It won't be the main line. It won't be a race. It won't be an occupation. Uh, and I addressed this in my presentation also. The language is not race. 
And it is understood in all other histories, in German history, Greece history, and every history, they talk about these languages, but they don't see it as a race coming over and taking and replacing their cultures. They see it as only a language spread. That is one point. And uh, it's not can I intervene? Can I intervene? You're repeating yourself. I'm Please, asking a simple have, question. How did the language explained. spread? If you inter interrupt, I cannot explain no, no, the further. You're repeating yourself. So I've got that point you're making that it was an imperialist conspiracy and so on and so forth. And this doesn't happen elsewhere. But why did the how did the language spread? You need to answer that question. And that question can't be answered by means of a conspiracy. You need to answer that question. You're not addressing that question. You're addressing all other issues. You're not addressing that question. That's what I want an answer. I'm so sorry. Please give me five minutes. Okay. Would that be possible? Yes, yeah, possible. Okay. I'll give myself. Okay. So the first two points I have already explained. Language is not race, and it's not a replacement. Race is replacement. Okay. And language spreads for many reasons. Languages spread across the world. It, is, it has happened across the world for many reasons. And the, the next point I explained in my presentation is civil, civilizational change and civilizational movement. The civilizational movements happen within the subcontinent. This happened in Africa also. The Bantu languages have spread across Africa. Africa has so many languages. But the Bantu languages have actually spread across the uh, African subcontinent, but it's not a replacement. The language is spread for many reasons. In, uh, in, uh, in subcontinents, in continents that are resource rich, the language spread, cultural spread, civilizational spread doesn't happen through war, doesn't happen through occupations. It happens through civilizational change and adaption and coexistence. And I explained this through civilizational movements, the coexistence and movements, how we exchange our ideas, how we exchange our thoughts, how we exchange our equipment, our pottery, our things, is actually traced in history. Probably same thing might have happened with languages. The languages may have evolved, may have moved, as the people were moving from uh, place to place as part of the civilizational movements, rather than occupations and uh, complete replacement. Uh, the language spread uh, is still, uh, is still, uh, of course, it is developed as a theory in the 19th century. All of you are uh, language specialists, uh, linguistics, and Professor Paranjipe has done a lot on the languages. Uh, but my expertise is in uh, history and I have studied genetics, probably you may discount it. Um, it's, it's okay. I'm not arguing about the genetics now. But the, but the evidence, we have to work with the evidence that we have. The evidence that we have shows us, people moved and people shared and people evolved, people coexisted in India. Why can't that be true for the languages? Why should the languages should be going to war with each other? Why should the languages be replacing each other when the people are not replacing, cultures are not replacing each other? We don't have evidence for that. Uh, and similarly, language spread has happened uh, in many other places across the world. Language spread um, has different historical, uh, socio-historical um, reasons. It's not replacement or it's not race, it's not uh, occupation. That, that's all I have about the language. I'm absolutely not persuaded. I'm sorry. I'm absolutely not persuaded. You have not answered the question. You just repeated yourself once again. One minute, one minute. I, I, I think there are two different issues that why should Indian history be written from the point of view of conquest? Why should we start with an invasion? Why not start with the uh, archaeological evidence of people who say it. that's perfectly good. Now, the other question you raised, Professor Raju, if I might address that, we know very little about languages used in the Mesolithic, Paleolithic times, very little. 
our knowledge of languages starts with the so called vedic people because even with the harappan language we know very little frankly therefore the real question is how did these languages come flourish because the vernacularization happened much later much much later 10th century 12th century and in history we know that languages are linked to trade and power power can be military it can be economic uh english spreads in a certain way persian spreads in a certain way so we can't discount that there was that's why i used the more polite phrase migration we didn't even talk about writing how does writing spread you see writing is very important because in india we had writing long ago and then it disappeared what we call nagari is a much later much much later thing brahmi is much older then there is an uh, almost disappearance of scripts for a while so my only point is there's a we are filling in the blanks i don't believe lavanya ji is giving us throwing the book at us no i think she's saying is raising fundamental questions about how indian history should be understood and and for me what resonates with atmanirbhar is the prehistory of india is much more atmanirbhar yes. you know paleolithic mesolithic bhim bedka and then we we have to look at cultural history we have to look at anthropological history flora fauna and i think the coexistence versus replacement theories profound i believe i think these are the paradigms of history that we need to alter and the questions you raise are very profound i'm not disagreeing and there's no simple answer and i certainly think there were migrations i mean you can't rule that out you don't know exactly when they happened because you see the greeks and the hindus and the persians were were very inter interlinked look at the sun cult the mitra cult look at varun you know so there are so many stories to be told and there'll be time to tell these stories i think i just wanted to say two things and then i'm going to uh, ask uh, 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 professor hada and then uh, Rajvi ji, to conclude after the uh, chairman's remarks, uh, Professor Kalmalkar's remarks, I only wanted to say, I'm so sorry we can't host you in person, offer you tea, let alone lunch. I'm feeling very bad. IIS has a tradition of hospitality. Uh, Jitendra ji talked about uh, how not meeting in person uh, creates a distortion in our interaction, in our conviviality. i think that uh, you know sharing a cup of tea you know there's a breakout session uh, and uh, professor raju and uh, professor bemsani can go into the corner of a room and battle it out etc we are missing those things so just for that i invite all of you here the only other thing i wanted to say which i can't avoid saying because uh when i went to orcha i realized something i never knew which is that uh, the city of orcha uh is ruled by ram raja it is not ruled by a, a human being and the kings of orcha they shifted to tikamgarh and they vacated the city to raja ram why because ram was driven out of ayodhya the temple and they built a temple but it's not occupied because the armies of aurangzeb came and the queen hid ram lalla in her own palace in the haram in the antarpur which has now become the ram temple there if you go there and the final thing is when you go to ocha it's not easy to get there there's no you know by airport you can take a shatabdi you have to get off at jhansi jhansi is in up then you cross to madhya pradesh the small border you can even uh, it's only 20 25 kilometers you cross from up to madhya pradesh and it's a different world because jhansi fell now how was jhansi ruled by lakshmi bai that's because the marathas were given jhansi after chhatrasal you see chhatrasal was saved by baji rao he gave some territory and mastani there's a whole history there 
and some bundelas resent how the marathas tried to pressure them but i want to go back to what jitendra ji said that there were pockets which were uncolonized in india there's a part of the indian psyche that is uncolonized and this is exactly what uh, prafulla ji said you read anandamat in anandamat the defense of india comes from the uncolonized part of the indian psyche which is always atmabal as shashi prabha ji said so we will give everything we'll give our land we'll give our money we won't give our souls so the sanatan parampara allows for resistance from an uncolonized portion of the totality of our civilization from where the defense is always mounted swaraj is like saraswati you don't see it at times but when the conditions are right you know it's there it's just beneath the soil so uh with these words and now that the ram temple has been built he mentioned that when we talk about raj ram temple was a big thing in this right now let us hope that the ram lalla which was brought to orcha can return to ayodhya and that you know raja ram ki salami hoti hai you know there's a guard who salutes ram in the morning if you go to that temple it's unbelievable so there is a history of india how this civilization preserved itself under the most adverse circumstances and today when circumstances are favorable we really have to think very deeply to get about get out of the pangupan you know this dwarfism cretinism of uh, colonial post independent indian intellectual production with these words i thank you all uh for joining in i thank the two panelists of this session i thank lavanya ji i must announce she's doing a workshop on historiography in july please join us all of you spread the word and now i'll turn it over to uh professor shripad kalmar ji to to wind up and then final remarks from whoever so i have wound up already because such a nice discussion was there are no more points to be added i have uh, nothing much to say other than saying that i am learning a lot by attending a conference like this and i am very happy very pleased uh, for that yes i now hand it over to uh, who rajveer singh professor rajveer sharma sorry yes please yes uh, please everyone tomorrow morning sir we have international yoga day at the institute follow at 8:30 followed by followed by the last session of this conference thank you all thank you and good evening thank you uh, professor kamalka uh, in fact uh, professor pranjpe has made my task a bit simple because he has already given some kind of a uh, summary of the discussions and the gist of uh, the learned uh, you know the the presentations by the by very learned speakers and i must uh, thank professor md srinivas who chaired the first session uh, this afternoon uh, in which professor ck raju and professor shripad karmalkar uh, presented their papers on decolonizing mathematics and science uh, let me tell you that professor uh, raju when i met him since then i know that he is a lone fighter uh, uh, on this issue that there's a need for decolonizing mathematics or if i can say so indianizing the the mathematical uh, sciences uh, if i understand him correctly and he is the fighter against the outside influences particularly of the church conspiracy in this uh, you know, fight professor shripad karmarkar in fact uh, insisted on basically Uh, the need for developing the the component technology which will uh, support and sustain the the swaraj in technology and there is a need of course uh, to develop the the indigenous uh, uh, technology particularly in the field of semiconductors uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you professor raju and professor karmarkar for giving such a wonderful talk 
Uh, I also thank uh, Professor Shripad uh, Karmalkar to preside over the second session uh, uh, this uh, of this uh, afternoon deliberations. And uh, particularly, I would like to place my thanks to Dr. J.K. Bajaj and Professor Lavanya Bensani. Let me tell you that uh, there is, uh, I, I noted some kind of uh, similarity between the, the thoughts of both the speakers, uh, Professor Bajaj and Professor uh, Lavanya. And particularly, I can say that they, both of them seem to be arguing that the foundations of Indian history and civilization and culture, in fact, uh, are much more independent than they are treated as. And uh, they both of them perhaps are arguing that they need to rewrite uh, the, the history as well as uh, the sociology, of course, based on data. And that data needs to be very deeply uh, explored and used. In fact, uh, one another kind of similarity between the two speakers, if I am correct, uh, is that uh, the Indian sources are hidden in the land and people of the country. <laughs> this is one of the very important argument of Professor Lavanya, and perhaps uh, Professor Bajaj was, or, was also arguing by uh, uh, referring to uh, Orcha time and again, that go and understand the people, what they think about power, what they think about history, what do they think about their livelihoods, and therefore that that could be much more different when, than what has been presented by the, the imperialist historians or their followers. So therefore, the narratives that have been uh, created, as, as she was arguing, that uh, the imperialist uh, historians begin with invasions. It is not that uh, she was discounting that there were no invasions, but the history of India is not the history of invasion alone. Replacement uh, was not the part of history to begin with. And therefore, she has explained uh, her argument with uh, the support of the genetic evidences as well as prehistoric uh, evidences. And therefore, what has happened later, uh, in fact, uh, is where the replacement uh, was sought by the invaders. And uh, therefore, even then, can we say that they succeeded in uh, replacing the civilizational roots and foundations of India? And I think no, the uh, civilizational foundations of India could not be replaced even by the invaders, whether they were Mughals or they were the British. And uh, therefore, thank you very much, Professor Lavanya, uh, for giving a very brilliant kind of a presentation and be part of these deliberations. We have learned a lot uh, uh, from your presentation and the presentation of Professor Bajaj. I, uh, before I, I close uh, my remarks, I would request that tomorrow there is a, a last kind of a day of our deliberations. And uh, it, it will begin again at 10 with uh, the presentation by Professor uh, S.R. Bhatt on understanding the idea of, uh, understanding the Swarajan ideas. I think it would be a wonderful kind of discussion again. And then uh, Professor uh, Sri Tarun Vijayji, uh, who is the chairman of uh, National Monuments Authority, will give a valedictory address. So I invite you all again uh, tomorrow morning at 10. And uh, until then, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Namaste. See you tomorrow. Bye. Namaste. Nice See you tomorrow, Professor Makran Param Treji. Yeah. I don't know whether Anuradha ji wanted to ask something. I saw her uh, video on, but uh, I didn't. Yeah. Thank you, Anuradha ji. Okay. Tomorrow. 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 Yeah. So, tomorrow. Uh, no, no. I was just lovely. wondering. I was just wondering that if it's so clear the genetic history, why is it not more clearly expressed in our, you know, educational uh, books and all? That's all, but another time, yeah. That, what that's the argument, to? right? We should seek our beginnings in uh, in our people and in our land, not in the languages, not outside India. Yes. That's that's the whole Why? argument. 
why is this not even presented as an alternative story you know like i don't mind you say the iranian invasion but at least say that this is what latest research is showing why are we not being able to introduce that that's why we're doing a workshop on historiography <laughs> that's the so reason professor pranch we wanted this workshop and wanted to bring this out means what a new so, ideas and art for labor but how can we so, get more children how can yeah how can we get more students and all to participate how can we get children to you know listen to it even if they are are we reaching this out to schools to history teachers like how how can we get more involvement from both sectors like three departments across the country should be informed that this is happening they should attend we will talk about it in the history workshop there are some ideas yeah yeah absolutely thank you very much uh, professor kadmukar thank you very much namaste so dr lavan